Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to our Sylvia Asma webinar. I would like to welcome all the participants as well as the presenter today. I would like to give a special thanks to our sponsor for today's webinar, Novartis Malaysia, AstraZeneca as well as Boston Scientific. So we're going to start our first session uh, for today's presentation will be uh, by Prof. Anja from UKM. So Prof. Anja Banyulin is a senior consultant physician and pulmonologist in Hospital Tuan Kumu Chris, Nusti Kebangsaan Malaysia or HUKM Hospital. She specialized in asthma and COPD. In fact, she was the chairperson for our national asthma CPD. Without further delay, I would like to invite uh, Prof. Ask, uh, Prof. Anjaban to give her first presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Amin. Uh, so I'd like to thank Amin and the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to give this talk on severe asthma and for the opportunity to share some thoughts. Let me just uh, share my slides. Minimize my face. Okay, all right. So I've been tasked uh, to give a talk on severe versus difficult to treat asthma. And uh, as mentioned, I am actually based in HUKM. So um, I have no disclaimer. Uh, I would like to start by um, talking, just showing these two apples. Right? So when Amin asked me to give the talk about uh, the two different types of asthma, I'm thinking it is very similar to when you shop for apples at the supermarket. At a glance, one is very much like the other. But for those of you apple lovers, there is a difference between a Washington apple and a Fuji apple. Can anyone tell me the difference? It's a very soft sound. Okay, I'm going to talk louder. All right, can anyone tell me the difference between a Washington apple and a Fuji apple? Uh, okay. So I think the main difference would be the price, right? A Fuji apple can go up to like a lot of money and uh, sometimes the size is a little bit bigger. Uh, the Washington apple usually looks a bit fatter and juicier like the one on the left hand side. In terms of taste wise, um, uh, Fuji apple is sweeter. Okay? So this just highlights that even uh, between two apples there are differences. So what more uh, patients with asthma and the different terms that you use for asthma control. So probably want to start by just me. Propandia, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Can you speak louder, Propandia? It's very loud already. I don't know how to be louder. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It's very loud. Better, better, Propandia. Better. Oh, okay. Okay, any louder and the neurologist next door will complain. Okay, kejap, huh? let me try again. Can you hear me now? I'm very close to the screen, so I might look a little bit big in my face, like one of those. Clear, 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 Propandia. I think I'm going to move further because I do not want to look like an idiot. Can you still hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, now it's clear. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, Amin. Right. So, maybe just some points when we talk about asthma. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, Amin. Right. So, maybe just some points. One is actually that guidelines recommend that we differentiate between difficult to treat and severe asthma. Uh, so, this is what you read when you actually open up the GINA and when you look at various papers that have been published. Right. Uh, so we should acknowledge the fact that this is actually sometimes not as easy as it sounds. Okay. To what extent can we actually do it and how much is achievable in a clinical practice, we do not know. But the statement number one still holds true that at any point we should try and differentiate between a patient who has got difficult to treat asthma from severe asthma and I hope that after we go through the slides you would um, agree with me that this differentiation is an important one to make. So maybe we'll start with what is uncontrolled asthma. So many times you get patients who come in and they come in with an exacerbation of asthma and uh, your MO will say this is uncontrolled asthma or you would have made a diagnosis of uncontrolled asthma. So uncontrolled asthma uh, from a probably a simplified uh, point of view would be an asthma which includes one or both of the following. Uh, you're going to look at symptoms and you're going to look at the asthma attacks of exacerbations. Right? So in terms of symptoms, someone who's got uncontrolled asthma would have sim poor symptom control, meaning that they have very frequent symptoms of asthma or they actually need a lot of reliever therapy to actually maintain their symptoms at a reasonable level for them to undergo their daily activities of living. Uh, 
someone who actually has got activities which are limited by asthma and night awakenings due to asthma is also someone who has got poor symptom control. So in the UK, uh, they actually use the Royal College of Physicians three question, which I'll show in the next slide, or the asthma control test, which I will also show in the next slide. I think in my setting, uh, we use the ACT score more frequently. Uh, it's a validated score, um, and it translates the patient's symptoms into a score. So uh, as in any scoring system, there is a cutoff. So 20 appears to be the cutoff. If you have a uh, a score, a ACT score of less than 20, then you have not achieved good symptom control. So with that in mind, when you see a patient, um, I think amongst the many chatting and, and talking to the patient, you should at least try and tease out the patient's symptom control. Okay. Um, the other one that uh, would also show you that the patient's got uncontrolled asthma is the number of asthma attacks, or some people actually call it exacerbations, right? So exacerbations uh, doesn't necessarily have to lead to hospitalizations. It can also uh, be defined by this burst of oral corticosteroids that the patient has. So part of the history would be to ask um, when you were unwell, were you given steroids? And this episode of unwellness, which required control with OCS, how many times did you actually have it in the last one year? Okay, so these are the important points in terms of uncontrolled asthma. So uh, this is the uh, ACT score. So these are five questions, right? And uh, for each question, there is a selection from one to five, and five means you are absolutely well. So if you score five out of five, meaning you have a, um, perfect control, uh, you would be considered uh, very well controlled. Um, so these questions, uh, for, it's related to the last four weeks prior to presentation to you in clinic or in the hospital. And they're very useful, I think. I personally find it useful when a patient comes to clinic and they actually have the ACT. And from the ACT score, I'll be able to use that as a platform to ask them uh, further questions. So for example, um, if you see over here that, uh, let's say, has your asthma affected your work? Uh, have you had shortness of breath? and uh, how is your sleep, this is the effect, uh, how much the asthma affects your sleep, how often do you use your uh, reliever therapy, and how would you rate your asthma control. So in this sense, you will be able sometimes to pick up the fact that patients may be hesitant with the um, reliever therapy. For example, they may score very symptomatic here, but they do not use, your, they do not use the uh, subitamol. So you can use that as a platform to ask the patient oh, what what happens, uh, uh, do you use your inhaler, why do you not use it? And then they can say, oh, I didn't know I can use it, I thought it was only just shortness of breath, I didn't know that just the chest tightness is there. So you can actually iron out some of the misconceptions that's, that the patient has. The last question I find uh, in particular quite uh, interesting is the fact that the patient will rate their own asthma control. So we do know that there are papers, and I think if you have attended asthma talks before, we always talk about the perception of asthma control by the patient. Studies have shown that patients and doctors perceive asthma, um, they're not very good at perceiving the actual control of asthma. So this can actually tease out that problem. So for example, in some cases, patients actually score, um, they say they've got symptoms, uh, they say they do have shortness of breath, uh, the sleep is affected maybe three, four times in the night, in a week, sorry, and uh, they, they do use their subutamol or they don't use their subutamol. Then when you look at the last question, uh, they are supposed to rate their asthma control. And if they rate very well control, then immediately there is a mismatch between um, the correct perception of asthma control and the patient's symptoms. And you can use that again to ask, oh, uh, you know, uh, I noticed that you actually think that is well controlled. Uh, how do you feel about that? And they probably say, oh, well, the last time I was worse, now I'm better, so this is good control. So then you will be able to um, iron out the misconception to say that actually well controlled asthma means that uh, your sleep will be unaffected. Uh, you should do all the things that you can do without any limitation. And usually when you're well, you would notice yourself that you wouldn't need the subutamol or the reliever therapy. Okay, so over here is just a scale um, where 20 and above is actually well controlled and below 20 is actually poorly controlled and if you get someone less than 15 then it's very poorly controlled asthma. 
Uh, so as mentioned, I think some of you might have seen this questionnaire before. This is the RCP or Royal College of Physicians three questions for asthma. A little bit more simplified. So let's just have a look at the questions that they ask. Have you had difficulty sleeping? So it's similar to the ACT. Has your usual asthma symptoms during the day? Yes, so it's also similar to the ACT. And has your asthma interfered with your usual activities? So this is also captured in the ACT, but the ACT has got more things, right? So in our setting, we actually use the ACT score as a way of looking at the patient's asthma control uh, in clinic. So then we move on to the next one, which is uh, what is uh, difficult to treat asthma? So difficult to treat asthma is uh, asthma that is uncontrolled despite treatment with medium or high dose uh, inhaled corticosteroid plus a second controller drug or maintenance oral corticosteroids and this affects 17% um, of people in asthma has been reported. Okay. So we have a look over here. This is the GINA track, which I think um, throughout the talk, perhaps you'll see it quite often, but because I'm the first speaker, so I'm obliged to actually show the GINA because there are some uh, changes, right? So um, the GINA, the main difference is actually in the two tracks, right? So it, uh, in the past, it was only one track and, some, and by being one track, it makes it a little bit difficult for us to see which is the preferred treatment. So what they did was they split the combination into two, making the preferred reliever and controller a little bit more obvious. So you can see that the top track, which is called track one, is actually um, uh, the preferred uh, controller and uh, preferred reliever therapy. And this would be the ICS formaterol uh, reliever therapy. And this is actually uh, mainly data from the Sigma trial, which shows that the ICS formaterol is actually just as efficacious and superior to actually sabamonotherapy and sabamonotherapy has been shown to be associated with mortality and increased risk of exacerbations. So in an asthma patient, there is a step up and hopefully there is a step down. It is, um, it is something that we uh, as physicians should be aware of. I know we are talking about um, difficult to treat asthma and severe asthma, but once you achieve control, you should actually consider stepping down therapy. So let's just have a look at the step up uh, therapy in this patient. So uh, step one or step two would actually be someone who has got asthma control that only needs as needed uh, low dose ICS formethorol. In uncontrolled asthma, patients would be actually on step four or step five, right? So these are patients who are actually already on medium dose maintenance ICS formethorol uh, and the reliever would be as needed low dose formethorol or patients who are actually on step 5 who already actually have other maintenance uh, plus a second controller drug. So this would be either uh, LAMA or uh, maintenance OCS as well. So uh, the next slide will show you the, um, the dosage of uh, inhaled corticosteroids. So we always talk about like medium dose and high dose and low dose. So when you actually look at the inhaler, it is good for you to see the components that are in the in inhaler and the dose that is in the inhaler because some formulations are different. So let's just have a look. For example, we'll just take the um, uh, let's just take budesonide. So budesonide can come in either a dry powder or a pressurized meter dose inhaler, right? So the low dose is a total daily dose of two hundred to four hundred. Whereas if it's more than 400 to 8 and within uh, below 800 or 800 and below, it is medium dose. When the patient is taking more than 800 uh, puffs of ICS mics in a day, then this patient is considered to be on high dose. So any patient who is already on this, who is uncontrolled with an additional reliever therapy would be deemed um, fitting the, the, the criteria that we want. So next we move on to severe asthma. So in severe asthma, uh, it is actually part of difficult to treat asthma. So it is actually uncontrolled despite the patient being uh, adherent to the maximum optimized therapy or it is something that is actually being controlled but it worsens when you actually try to taper down the high dose treatment. So I think this one is a smaller subset of patients. Remember the other one was actually 17% and this is actually only about 5% of people with asthma. 
So the ERS ATS Task Force on Severe Asthma defines severe asthma. They say that the term severe asthma should be reserved for patients with refractory asthma and those in whom response to treatment of comorbidities is incomplete. So just to remember that um, severe asthma is a subset of difficult to treat asthma and it's actually reserved for a smaller percentage of patients who actually have got refractory asthma in whom uh, they, their response to treatment is actually not as good despite treating all the other comorbids that the patient has. So I think the important thing to remember is that these patients, um, they suffer as a result of severe asthma. They actually experience low quality of life and uh, these are the subset of patients that you will see coming into patient, uh, coming into hospital every now and then. And uh, they are at increased risk of severe adverse effects from the high dose asthma therapy. So uh, they would also be uh, at increased risk of um, the overdose from the burst of OCS. So they would be prone to getting either osteopenia or osteoporosis. So this diagram is actually, I found it from the internet and I thought it was quite interesting uh, diagrammatic representation of what I mentioned before that uh, severe asthma and difficult to uh, control, or difficult to treat asthma is like this and it's actually a subset and um, at any one point patient can go from one to the other. So I probably want to just uh, share uh, certain scenarios. So the first scenario is actually, so these two scenarios are to talk about the misconception and when, uh, when a patient says something, we should be quite clear what they actually mean and we, it's very dangerous to take them uh, for what they say, right? So for example, this is the patient's perception of severe asthma. They come to the hospital and they say, oh, I can't mop the floor, my sleep is not good, uh, I cough so much, my throat is sore, can you give me some diphlegm or give me some uh, cough syrup? Uh, I'm not sure when I can feel better again, I've got severe asthma. So they use the word severe asthma. But when we actually look at the patient, the patient is only using Saba monotherapy and that's self-purchase. So um, does the patient have severe asthma? Well, not really because the treatment is actually incomplete. Remember what we said, it must be actually patients who have actually comorbids and everything all sorted and still have symptoms. But here we have a patient who is actually steroid naive. Okay, so let's see what we can do for the patient. So at this point, I think you should start the patient on ICS and any ICS would do because this is steroid naive. Anything goes, you start steroids and what happens? Patient's symptoms improve. Remember, we talked about the ACT of less than 20 is no good. So the ACT score has gone up to 23 out of 25, which is very good. So this is a typical patient, steroid naive. You give any dose or any type of ICS and the patient improves. Does this person, does this patient have severe asthma? No, this patient does not have severe asthma. So patients may perceive their asthma as severe uh, because of you know, their intense symptoms, the frequent symptoms, but it is important as clinicians when we see the patient to know that this term severe asthma doesn't necessarily, you know, just because of the symptoms, it doesn't mean that the patient has got a severe disease because you need to also look at the therapy that the patient's on. And uh, if the patient's steroid naive, you do know that um, asthma is an inflammatory disease. And um, at this point, the patient's only on Saba. So there is no, uh, there's no um, attempt to actually solve the inflammation. When you do solve it, the patient then uh, will improve and uh, will become well controlled with very low dose inhaled corticosteroids. You probably ask yourself at this point, can you actually give the patient oral corticosteroids? Um, so I think OCS is a little bit of an overkill because the delivery of drug for asthma is actually through in inhalation. So the attempt to actually solve the inflammation in the airway should be via the conduit of inhalers rather than oral corticosteroids, which in itself carries a higher uh, incidence of adverse events. So let's then look at the patient's perception of mild asthma. So the patient says, yes, I have cough, but it gets better with my blue inhaler. I take the blue inhaler about six times a day. My asthma is quite well controlled. So patient's happy, say, I'm well controlled. But if you look at the history, so you could get someone who comes in and says their asthma is well controlled. It's important for, the, for you to ask them from the ACT score, you'll be able to know that they actually have cough. You'll be able to know that they use the inhaler many times. So the, 
a CT score is quite good. You can actually fish out this detail for you to actually use it as a platform to discuss with the patient what the issues are. Again, patient is only using sabamonotherapy, self-conscious, right? So what are the points here? Patient perceived as control, patient does not seek help and patient continues with the sabamonotherapy. Patient comes to clinic with this, you do not ask the story and you actually miss the fact that the patient is using the blue inhaler up to six times. You do not actually change the medication. What will happen is the patient will continue on sabamonotherapy. So this is one of the dangers uh, which we have also found in Malaysia in one of the unpublished data which we intend to publish, Sabina trial, which shows that nearly 50% of patients are actually overprescribed with uh, sabamonotherapy, sab inhalers. Right? So um, if you have a look at this patient, you can see that they perceive as uh, well controlled, uh, but they are actually not well controlled because there is misconception of what, uh, what they can actually achieve. Okay? So uh, patients, and uh, it's important to note that even patients with mild asthma, if they have symptoms and they are heavily reliant on Sabah, you really need to actually tease out that problem. And in this case, what should we do? Um, you know, Saba monotherapy is not recommended. If you have a look at the um, GINA track 1, track 2, even in track 2, where they actually uh, did not use the ICE, did not offer ICS formaterol as reliever therapy, they actually put as the uh, Saba, Saba plus a dose of ICS uh, whenever needed as a reliever therapy. So, this slide is just a little bit about Saba overuse, right? So, um, I think we should remember that patients with uh, mild or infrequent symptoms can still have uh, exacerbations which can be fatal. So studies have shown that uh, if you use regular Saba monotherapy, there is a decrease in your beta receptor regulation, um, less bronchoprotection and you have less uh, bronchodilator response. So in another sense, a regular Saba use actually causes a, a more hyperactive airway uh, an increase in your allergic response and the inflammation which is the backbone problem in asthma is not targeted. So what happens is that you have a vicious cycle of symptoms. You actually use the reliever but the reliever doesn't actually target the inflammation. Therefore the inflammation is uncontrolled leading to more symptoms and leading to more reliever use. So this is actually some, this is a cycle that some of our patients have. Uh, and we should be aware of this when we actually see the patient in clinic so we can uh, identify these patients and put a stop to the cycle of uh, monotherapy. So what do you uh, do when you get a patient with uh, asthma? I think uh, in terms of severe asthma, difficult to treat asthma, you can't get away from it that you need to do a history and this is what you need to tease up from the patient. You need to look at the respiratory symptoms by asking open-ended questions and you want to see whether this uh, symptom, the symptoms that they have, whether it's actually wheezing or shortness of breath or chest tightness of cough, whether there is actually a history of variability. So uh, you hope that from the many, many things that they say, you'll be able to tease out that the symptoms are sometimes good, sometimes not so bad. Uh, if you're lucky, sometimes they'll be able to see that symptoms are worse at night or worse during the daytime. And in some of the patients, they'll be able to tell you that the cold makes it worse or the, cold, or the hot air makes it worse or they, when they laugh a lot or when, and when they actually do exercises, right? And some patients will say that every time I get a chest flu, I actually get a very bad uh, asthma exacerbation. It takes a long time for me to get better. So it's important to also note that there isn't a single confirmatory test for asthma. But the point is that the diagnosis of asthma should be confirmed objectively because um, I think we always hear of the term TB is a great mimicker. I think this is also true of asthma. Asthma is also a great mimicker. So you can actually get other things but they present as asthma symptoms and if you do not uh, confirm it objectively, you are actually subjecting the patient to unnecessary uh, ICS. So this is taken from the GINA 2021 and uh, I, th I think this slide is very good because um, it talks about the uh, tests that are available for someone who you suspect has got asthma. 
right? So uh, you can actually see that they want a documentation of expiry airflow limitation and you also want to see variability. So what you need to do be you actually do a spiral and then you give the patient either nebulizer or a pressure pressurized meter dose inhaler subutamol and you actually do a repeat test. And what you hope to see would be that the airway opens up after your uh, bronchodilator and that's the reason why it's called bronchodilator reversibility test. So the, the number that you need to remember will be a 12% increase and a 200 mil increase. Okay. If you do not have spirometry, um, the other recommended thing, and this is also written in the CPG, would be to um, document variability in peak flow over a period of two weeks. And what we're looking at is the average daily diurnal uh, peak flow variability of more than 10%. Okay, other things would be that you may want to give the patient an anti-inflammatory treatment and repeat the spirometry before and after. Again, uh, or you can actually do, sorry, do the peak flow and you look at the variability and you can actually do a spiral. So again, it's 12%, 200 mils or peak flow more than 20%. Uh, other things that you can actually do would be a bronchial provocation test. And this is done in hospital Serdang. So if you have any patients, you can actually consider uh, referring to them. Uh, this is the exact opposite where they actually give uh, either hypertonic saline or mannitol uh, standard doses of methacholine and what you want to see would be a fall instead of an increase you get a fall from baseline more than 20 percent okay so um, so these are the uh, investigations that uh, that are stated in the guidelines and some of them are actually readily available for most of us and we should actually do it at some point, you will have a, a hospital or clinic nearby that actually has got spirometry. So I think there should be some effort on your part to refer the patient for spirometry that is involved. So this is actually how we calculate reversibility. You have your pre and post and the FEV1. So it's actually the post FEV1. So this is the measured. This is the predicted. So we're, having, uh, we're going to have a look at the measured. We don't look at the percentage predicted, look at the measured, right? So this is actually post. So uh, you're going to measure the FEV1. You're going to actually divide. So for example, your post FEV1 minus your pre FEV1 over your pre FEV1 times 100 will be your reversibility. And you want to look at the rise in the FEV1, whether it's more than 200 mils. So what do you need to ask the patient? Or what do you need to consider? Number one, is it really asthma? Number two, are there any comorbids that are affecting asthma? Certainly there are obesity, for example, allergic rhinitis, post nasal drip. And uh, have we considered all potential aggravating factors? And is the patient taking the medication? And at some point, when do I refer the patient? So don't forget to check the inhaler technique. Um, it's important for you to see how the patient uses to correct the patient and you want to confirm. So you yourself need to know how to actually measure the, uh, how to actually use the inhalers. So I think before we actually um, teach the patient, we should empower ourselves. So in our hospital, we actually have um, pharmacists who teach, but we also teach our MOs that they should be aware of the technique. So you want to review the possibilities of uh, comorbidities and the contributing symptoms. Right. So I think we talked about uh, inhaler technique, patient taking a medication like uh, ACE, ACE inhibitor, reflux of esophagitis, and don't forget the nose because it's a one airway. So you need to sort out the nose before you sort out the lung. If you keep getting post nasal drip, you're never going to get someone with controlled asthma. Non body fiber risk factors, one third of pregnant, pregnant women can actually have worsened asthma. So you need to be aware of that. And if someone is asthmatic and pregnant, you need to actually bring the um, the uh, the appointments nearer uh, for you to actually monitor because when you have a hypoxic mother, you actually have a hypoxic baby. So uh, other non-modifiable uh, factors are food allergy as well as history of uh, sorry of near fatal asthma attacks. There's a typo there. So this is actually in terms of the severe asthma. I've mentioned most of this before, but I just like to reiterate, when you get someone, you need to confirm the diagnosis, right? So there's no way about it. The second thing would be you need to look for factors that have contributed to the poor asthma control. And this first and foremost includes inhaler technique. So the inhaler can be very good, but if the medication doesn't go into the lungs, then um, the inhaler is no good, okay? Suboptimal adherence. So I think one way is to ask the patient, have you ever forgotten to use your inhaler? 
right? Uh, rather than uh, ask to use the inhaler every day. I find that if you turn the question about the other way, um, just like during ward rounds this morning, uh, my MO tells me patients at here and no problem, you know, so did my medical student. So when I went in to talk to the patient, I asked, you know, there's so many inhalers, do you, have you ever missed any recently? And she said, yes. I said, how many times once or twice? She said, she nodded. Then she said, actually more than that, okay? So other things, uh, what I've mentioned before, right? Uh, optimizing management, right? So I think you can see that there is comorbids here and modifiable risk factors, which I have mentioned. And then uh, I forgot to mention earlier, but I would like to state, if the patient is obese, they need to lose weight. If the patient has got uh, is smoking, you need to offer smoking cessation. Do the Fagerstrom's questionnaire, look at the level of nicotine uh, dependence and offer smoking cessation. It is our... Uh, moral obligation as healthcare workers to actually uh, offer smoking cessation to anyone who's actually an active uh, smoker. So when we talk about optimizing treatment, I think you should start with the inhaler technique first. If it's not good, there's not much point in actually upgrading the therapy. I think uh, we have same problem again. Uh, Lapa, uh, okay or uh, LTRA if indicated, although the, um, the LTRA is quite weak, uh, it normally benefits patients with concurrent, um, uh, concurrent allergic rhinitis. So the other thing would be uh, looking at the response. So if the patient responds at three months, then you can actually uh, think about stepping down therapy. If the patient doesn't respond, then you probably want to see whether uh, go through all the lists again, optimize the treatment uh, before you actually consider that the patient has got severe asthma. So um, I probably want to end with this take home message, right? So that most patients, we should remember, can actually and should achieve good symptom control with minimal exacerbations, right? Uh, with just normal ICS containing controller therapy. But we should recognize the fact that some will not be able to achieve this with one or both of this, uh, even in maximal therapy. So these patients, um, in some of these patients, there it is due to like a true refractory severe asthma. But in many, many patients, it is actually due to comorbidities, right? And we need to be an ongoing thing. That means you can actually escalate therapy of your asthma but you should actually uh, look actively for the comorbidities, also for persistent environmental exposures, for example, haze, or um, maybe in some patients, they've actually moved house to a condo with uh, construction nearby, okay? Or psychosocial factors, for, for example, they have a houseman who has got very bad asthma attack, especially when doing pediatric posting because of the stress, right? So I think uh, it is important to distinguish between severe asthma and uncontrolled asthma. And just remember that the latter is much more common reason for persistent symptoms and remand. Okay, thank you for Andrea for the great presentation. Uh, I, we hope that uh, you can join us um, later during the case discussion. Move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Tan Juliang. So Dr. Tan Juliang is... Uh, Respiratory consultant based in uh, UMMC, UMC Malaya Medical Center. He is also an active member in the Mason Thoracic Society. Without further delay, I would like to invite Dr. Tan to give his presentation. Right. Uh, thank you, Amin, for the kind uh, introduction. And thank you, Amin, for the uh, invitation to share on this topic. So let me share my screen. All right, uh, you all can see my slides, just to confirm. Right, I guess, okay. So uh, so today, uh, I would like to share on the topic on phenotyping of severe asthma. Uh, basically, these are the outlines of uh, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, firstly, we're going to differentiate what is phenotyping versus endotyping. And uh, next, probably discuss a bit ways to phenotype severe asthma. And lastly, talking about uh, how do you use these um, biomarkers to personalize severe asthma treatments? At the end, I'll give you some take home messages from that. So, um, some definitions on some definitions on the topics. Uh, so, phenot phenotypes actually means observed characteristics, meaning what you see uh, physically. So, it's uh, usually when we say some 
phenotype of certain things is a result of interaction between genetic and the environmental factors that give you the uh, phenotype. So basically, you have, uh, you have been born with some, uh, some genes that interact with the environment that give you these phenotypes. Whereas endotyping basically is, means uh, something more uh, scientific, thing, uh, leading things like specific biological pathway that explain what is was observed of the phenotypes. Basically, this is uh, what the basic of phenotyping. So some cartoon features to differentiate phenotype and genotype. Okay, phenotype is what you see. Genotype is what is in their genes, uh, what is in their like uh, interleukins or cytokines that make up the phenotyping. So in simple terms, phenotype space the world, genotype plan for the phenotypes. And in correlation with asthma, uh, we can actually uh, put uh, use this concept of phenotyping and endotyping in asthma. So uh, I would say asthma is a heterogeneous disease. Um, even though asthma seems like just one uniform disease, of course, uh, when it comes to the severe asthma uh, conditions, you, you do have a lot of uh, some distinctive features that can actually differentiate them. And this asthma phenotyping is not something new. You can look at this evolution of asthma phenotyping. From 1947s, uh, they already someone tried to, trying to uh, differentiate asthma into extrinsic asthma and intrinsic asthma based on the uh, environmental triggers. And when you when you look uh, when when in 1958, uh, another another researcher tried to use eosinophils fields that try to predict the corticosteroid responsiveness. And later on, you can see here, 1988 to 1990s, there are already a multiple clinical trials trying to demonstrate what is this T2 or type 2 inflammations, uh, regardless of the, whether the patient having a atopic disease or not. And from there, you can see uh, multiple uh, biologics being developed to treat severe asthma. So the concept of phenotyping have been dated back way, way beyond uh, what we know nowadays. And it's easy, it's, uh, as, as I mentioned before, asthma has been a heterogeneous disease. They actually interplay between a lot of uh, factors, namely the gene genetic factors, uh, the environmental factors like pollution, or even uh, interaction with the uh, certain uh, micro, uh, uh, microorganisms, the lung microbiomes. And because of all these things, uh, uh, interactions, some, some of these asthma patients may eventually develop severe asthma uh, and uh, later on required biologics for treatment. And I, I, I still think this allergic mush uh, theory still hold true. Um, some of these patients that uh, have a significant history of atopy when they are born, and uh, these TH2 cells probably uh, was exist since young and uh, through the exposure to various allergens uh, during their childhood, uh, even their adulthood, even their uh, working life, um, slowly the, the, the inflammations will actually get more uh, intermittently, they get these patients. Uh, if not treated properly, you get every remodeling and subsequently develop bronchial uh, every hyper responsiveness that eventually, lastly, you, uh, you develop a severe form of asthma. And so far I've shown you there's actually various uh, attempt to actually try to phenotype asthma. Actually, you can see here, um, yeah, people talking about chow asthma, or adult onset asthma. There are also people talking about allergic asthma, late onset eosinophilic asthma, or very late onset asthma, obesity associated asthma, or smoking related you know, neutrophilic asthma. All this actually dependent on biomarkers. So, which biomarkers we are talking for basically are this type two or non-type two uh, biomarkers. So what are these type 2 and non-type 2 biomarkers? Uh, before that, biomarkers just simply means that uh, something that you can measure that uh, when you form, uh, that, is, that is actually more prominent in a uh, in certain populations that can show that these are a distinct uh, type of uh, conditions. So in asthma, uh, if you wanted to divide which is considered type 2, which is considered non-type 2 asthma, you can see here, those type 2 asthma probably consists of allergic asthma, pesticide-induced asthma, as well as your asthma. 
And there are, for those non type 2 asthma, probably those are infection related, obviously associated, or uh, uh, more commonly, some of them will be known as neutrophilic asthma. And in terms of the sorry, and in terms of the type two uh, asthma wise, it, um, when we look at the allergic component, there are also uh, some of them will actually look, uh, look at whether they are T two high or T two low. Um, T two low asthma it can be uh, your non type two asthma. Uh, non type two asthma can be less severe. Uh, usually, they have absence of area or systemic eosinophilia. Um, this group of patients usually do not have good response to four corticosteroids and uh, they are like responsive to, to those inhibitors of type 2 inflammations. Whereas those with type 2 high asthma, usually they are more severe form of asthma. Uh, more frequently, they have airway and systemic eosinophilia. They're quite responsive to glucocorticoids. And uh, if you give them biologics, they are quite responsive to it as well. So a little bit of uh, pathophysiology is very asthma to make you more understand where do this biomarker com comes about. So um, just imagine this is your airway epithelium. Okay, so uh, so this is your airway epithelium. So on uh, exposure to allergens, so there will be there will be multiple there will be multiple uh, interleukins or cytokines being produced. Okay. Okay, namely the IL-33 and IL-35 and TSLT. So uh, these uh, interleukins, when they produce, will stimulate the digit cells, and, uh, they, and all these allergens will be presented to the T cells, and the naive T cell will be activated uh, into uh, active T, uh, TH2 cells. And these TH2 cells will further stimulate interleukin 4 and interleukin 13, and stimulate the B, activate the B cells, and B cells will produce will, uh, will, uh, Will actually subsequently leading to the uh, production of IgE. Uh, this IgE also can be coming from the mast cells. As also, these TH2 cells also can produce other interleukin like IL5, IL13. IL5 usually activated the eosinophils, and IL13 usually uh, act on the purple cells, causing uh, increase in mucus productions. Uh, IL13 also in, involved in the airway hyperresponsiveness, meaning a high, higher level of IL13, uh, you get. Uh, more uh, I, I, I may have a responsiveness. So this part of the uh, pathophysiology is usually related to the allergic eosinophilic airway inflammation because it involves eosinophils, the IgE. So, but to, in order to activate all these cells uh, that in, uh, that's important for us, severe asthma, you have to go through all these pathways. Whereas the other part of the, the pathophysiology is um, is those non type two inflammations usually coming from uh, this pathophysiology. Uh, when the every epithelium is exposed to respiratory viruses, like commonly like your rhinoviruses, um, they do produce some uh, interleukins or cytokines, but these uh, interleukins and cytokines usually are much different from the uh, the usual uh, the usual one that we see in the type 2 inflammations. So we just Okay, so uh, when this uh, interleukin are being produced, like IL-33 and IL-25 and TSLP and IL-33, so in that, uh, almost similar as the, uh, the allergic pathway and eosinophilic pathway, uh, they, are, they are also stimulated in macrophages and the natural killer T cells. Uh, in term, when this uh, cytokine or interleukin be activated, they actually act, instead of acting on the uh, TH2 cells, they add on the uh, in it, lymphoid C, uh, cells too. So they, this also actually uh, stimulate the L5, L13 as well, similar to the function of TH2 cells, then also leading to uh, mucus hyperproductions, hyper your eosinophilia, and IL hyperresponsiveness. So if, uh, this is the part of uh, the uh, pathway of the non-TH2 pathway or the non-allergic eosinophilic airway uh, inflammation pathway. Okay, so uh, sounds very complicated, but I think uh, probably something easier to, to show you is this. Uh, you have the allergic pathway, 
you have the eosinophilic pathway. These two pathways is also jointly known as the TH2 driven inflammations. Uh, those that um, non TH non T2 driven inflammations uh, are mostly driven by your eosinophilic the neutrophils. These are what we call non type 2 inflammations. So basically, what you need to remember about phenotyping is this this three: the allergic, the eosinophilic, and uh, whether it is a neutrophilic. So how do you use uh, this? How do you use this concept of uh, uh, when you know about pathophysiology of CA asthma? So this uh, probably just to show you, there's a lot of interleukins, cytokines. Do you need to remember all this? Can we test all these things to determine whether they are type two or they are not type two? Uh, actually, you do not need this. Probably what you need is just these things. Uh, what we can do? Your IgE, pheno, and eosinophils, and sometimes maybe your neutrophils. These are probably what are more useful now clinically uh, in our usual clinical practice. So, way to phenotype sphere asthma. Usually, we need to get a clinical history, patient's lung function test, examinations. Uh, then, depends on the test that you want to do. Uh, like local, um, you can divide into local or systemic. If you want to detect local inflammations, you can use your exhaled nitro oxide, your like your phenol. Uh, even in overseas, some of them they can do a biopsy, nasal uh, cytology, or even transcranial lung biopsy, VAL, sputum cellularity to look at it, local inflammation in the airways. Of course, uh, more commonly, what we use is just a phenol. And systemic inflammation wise, we usually use, can use your blood isonophilia or look at the total IgE in the serums. Uh, in some private sector, you can even send for periostin. Uh, if you want to know specific IgE uh, for certain allergens in your blood that can trigger the severe asthma, probably can send for specific IgE. So these are probably things that we can do in clinical practice. So probably I'll just go a bit detail on each of these biomarkers. Uh, so firstly on the immunoglobulin E. So immunoglobulin E, I think from the pathophysiology of severe asthma just now, which I show you, uh, is actually uh, will cause a lot of um, inflammations as a result of them being activated uh, by the allergens. So it's, it will stimulate a lot of histamine, leukotrienes, IL-04, IL-13, and platelet activating factors. So all this will subsequently lead to food allergies, urticaria, allergic rhinitis, allergic asthma, and topic dermatitis. So uh, again, to make the picture bigger for you, uh, you can see here, uh, upon exposure to allergens, uh, there will be um, a lot of IG being produced, all these IG, uh, over minutes can actually cause uh, a lot. It can cause wheezing, bronchial constrictions, over hours, it can cause mucus productions, uh, or even lead to eosinophil recruitment as well. So, and multiple studies have shown that um, there are significant higher IgE being noted in asthma than healthy control. So, meaning these are very specific for asthmatic patients. So, most uh, those patients with severe allergic asthma definitely they will have higher IgE uh, than those in normal uh, healthy uh, adults. And if you had asthma, it's also found that uh, those patients with uncontrolled asthma had significantly higher IgE than those who have controlled asthma. So this is uh, a study that was conducted before. And IgE is not only had, uh, had also had a lot of significant impacts on other phase of asthma. You can see here in the sensitization phase, in the early phase, in the late phase, and in, in the very remodeling phase. So IgE played a significant role in severe asthma. So second, uh, talking about eosinophils, I think eosinophils, everybody was quite familiar with it. Uh, eosinophils is quite, um, is a normal um, cell that you tend to find in your, uh, one of the results you tend to find in your Google accounts. Uh, it, it can be IL-5 depend, uh, is dependent or independent. So um, dependent meaning uh, when it depends on IL-5, it's stimulated by IL-5, they can tend to cause T2 inflammations. But those that are IL-5 independence, these are your resident eosinophils, usually are important for your body uh, homeostasis. So just for example, in the normal airways, you do have some a little bit of eosinophils there as your body response, as, a, as your security in your uh, airway security. So, but in the aesthetic airways, they are, they are over production of these eosinophils that is triggered by your IL-5. So when, when the numbers is too much, of course, they're going to cause more problems. <coughs> And just to show you uh, what is the importance of eosinophils. So eosinophils is good for your post, post defense. It plays some roles in the, uh, against your pathogens, your bacteria, virus, or fungi. 
It's also important in your cell activations, your immune humoral immunity, your tissue review modeling and repair. Your cell appeal is also important in your metabolic homeostasis and immune response regulations. So, uh, and uh, also feels through various uh, interleukin and cytokines, they can activate different type of immune cells and further uh, cover the body homeostasis in a normal situation. So just to show you another picture here. So the green one actually is the what the eosinophils usually do. And the red one basically is the uh, pathological process that when the eosinophil was in excess or they cause. So in the normal situation, just an example in the lungs, it's actually important for your antigen presentation and immune modulations. But in excess, you can, uh, you can as I show you, they cause, can cause severe asthma. It's also a biomarker for your severe, for the severe asthma. So uh, of course, eosinophils has other various diverse functions as well, which I talk the details. But uh, I would say eosinophils is also important, one of the important cells in the body that we we still need it, but we don't need it in excess. So, uh, of course, there are also always the debates, uh, what is normal, what is not normal. This always depends on the populations. But in general, this is one of the uh, interesting publications in 2018. They're looking at uh, when do you say it's too much? Let's say it's when the ESO count more than uh, 1,500 cells uh, per microliter. But that is actually uh, way, way too much. In this in, when you have this kind of this level of uh, your sort of view counts, uh, you tend to get your sort of leukemia or your lymphoma, or sometimes certain uh, condition what we call hyper eosinophilic syndromes. Whereas if you had uh, things like asthma, atopic dermatitis, or villus pemphigoid, your level tend to be around zero to uh, 1,500 cells per microliter. So even the simple electrogenitis or eosinophilic uh, esophagitis, urticaria, you also tend to get about zero to 1,000 cells per microliter. So the level of eosinophils will correspond to various diseases. And in correlation in asthma, you can see here, those who have higher eosinophil counts uh, tend to have, uh, uh, those, when those patients with asthma, they tend to have a more a high eosinophil counts compared to those uh, healthy adults or those with COPD. Okay, so the red lines is, the level of eosinophil is lower in our healthy adults or even uh, COPD, uh, those with uh, smoking or COPD patients. And in relation to asthma, uh, if you can see here, this is a large cohort of population of 554,000. If uh, looking at uh, the various level of blood eosinophil counts, it's found that actually eosinophil counts of more than 300 cells per microliter. Uh, these kind of patients, they tend to have um, 30% increase in severe exacerbations, meaning the higher the level of the review counts, you tend to get more severe exacerbation than uh, in asthma. And um, some may ask, uh, in some of these earlier clinical studies, they tend to use sputum eosinophil counts rather than blood eosinophil counts. So can can we use blood eosinophil count as a replacement for sputum eosinophil count? And the answer is yes. Yeah, these publications uh, that was published just about three years ago, looking at the correlation between sputum and eosinophil counts, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with whether you're looking at the percentage or the uh, numbers, the cell count levels, it correlated very well. So there's a co good correlation between blood and sputum eosinophil count level in asthmatic patients. So if your center cannot do a sputum eosinophil count, then you can look at this, uh, every inflammation, you can just use your blood eosinophil count to gauge whether the patient has eosinophilia. So I hope eosinophil is induced in asthma. So you if you suspect as a patient having as asthma, of course you need uh, your spirometry to de demonstrate there's a reversible airflow obstructions uh, with uh, hyper-responsive or nocturnal symptoms. Then you can look at the look at the, the MBC of this patient or the sputum eosinophil abuse. If they have uh, peripheral blood eosinophilia. Probably this patient had asthma. Then you need to explore other history like age onset, other biomarkers, and the comorbidities. If they do not have this, then probably you need to find out whether they have other diagnoses, things like bronchiolitis, bronchial disease, HP, chronic sarcoidosis. Then, yeah, if not, then if it's a chronic infection, then probably you need to lavage and see whether the patient has something like bronchial disease or some NTM or things. Then, uh, if let's say you already started this patient on inhaled particular steroids and patient responding, you reduce the steroids, and the uh, is the they 
you can monitor the, uh, the blood disorder field count as well. So if let's say uh, it's actually, you can reduce it, then probably it's, uh, it's responding to your steroids, then probably these are uh, patient with as well. But if let's say uh, the insulin field count do not reduce with your particular steroid, probably asthma is not likely there. So lastly, talking about phenol. Uh, phenol, I think Dr. Professor did mention a bit, is measuring the airway nitro oxides. It's actually an indirect marker of eosinophilic airway inflammations. There are actually multiple variables that you can actually uh, get from the machines, but namely your low, intermediate, high level. Uh, but something just to be careful is that uh, phenol, there's a lot of uh, things that can affect the results. So high phenol also can be found in old, old age. Uh, it's also can, uh, affected by high gender ethnicity, A to P, rhinitis, and viral infections. So low phenol, some, some, some of these patients may be smoking, may be uh, a bit obese or having some acute control transcription, their phenol might be low as well. So they are, so the results can be affected by various environmental factors and also patient's physical factors. Um, so how, what is the role of nitro oxide in our body? I think it's actually uh, also important in our body from the as well. Again, I've shown you a whole list of what the physiological nitro oxide can do in our body, basically in the immune system, in the, in the local dilatations, muscle dilatations. Uh, specifically in asthma, uh, where the phenol come about is basically the, uh, it's a direct measurement of your IL-4 and 13. Uh, from there, you can gauge the response for ICS, FG, TSLP, or biologics and TLG. So, uh, phenol had a, uh, also said to have a relatively stronger association with exacerbation and every hepatic responsiveness than with lung function or asthma control. So, uh, sometimes uh, phenol also quite useful in, uh, in terms of uh, predicting the exacerbation and every hepatic responsiveness. So what is the role of phenol in asthma control? You can see here, uh, there are significant daily variation of uh, phenol in uncontrolled asthma uh, compared to those with control. So those with control asthma, the uh, phenol readings are more or less the same. Those with uncontrolled, they might have to die with back other variations or significant daily to daily variation. And there's also estimated annualized rate of severe exacerbations that are uh, increased with higher level of baseline phenol. So, uh, phenol is important in diagnosis, ICS response, adherence, and biologic therapy. Uh, NICE guideline actually published this, uh, which I think is very complicated. Uh, this is something that I quite like uh, that was just published this year uh, from the chest journals uh, using how to use phenol in asthma. Basically, if you are a patient with undiagnosed asthma and not ICS, you look at level, whether the phenol is 50 or less than 20. Uh, then from there, you, you know, then you make a diagnosis whether the patient is uh, asthma or not. And from after that, uh, then you can measure the phenol again and gauge uh, whether it's more than 50 or less than 20. And look at your patient whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. From there, you will see whether you need to optimize your ICS or you need to investigate further and consider whether the patient are having uh, an issue with instruments. Um, so there's always an issue regarding the cutoff, uh, what should you use, uh, 50 or 40. Um, different guidelines recommend different meaning, but this is the latest one. Uh, they look at more than 50. Um, in the previous guideline, NICE actually recommended more than 40 parts per million. Um, something to take in mind, even though there are few distinct biomarkers, there are also significant overlap of these biomarkers. You can see here, all three biomarkers sometimes can coexist in one patient. So, uh, in our real life practice, sometimes we do not see purely uh, your cerebellia, purely people with high IG, you know, just purely people with high you know. And um, people have tried to, uh, to distinguish whether can we actually um, use uh, all these combined uh, biomarkers and try to pick out whether any specific clusters or not. Um, and even though they try to do this, um, they find that every inflammation is very dynamic. Sometime this year, it may be predominantly at, uh, at, at um, certain uh, phenotypes. Then subsequently, after you treat it, it may be changed into a different domain of pathway. So, uh, so it's actually good to monitor the biomarkers. So it's about half of about half that actually change the biomarkers after the follow-up just was, uh, was found in the research. And I also quite like about this concept that was actually published by Injection and, and, and all uh, in the, uh, this journal called Workout for Sphere Asthma. They use uh, this concept of uh, 
airway inflammation and systemic inflammation. So to, to know whether this patient has systemic inflammation, you just simply use your blood and pure counts. To know the patient having significant airway inflammation, you use your chemo. So this will actually tell you um, the patient actually is predominantly having uh, those airway inflammation or those with systemic inflammations. <laughs> Uh, again, um, just to re uh, emphasize, uh, we're not typing as severe asthma, or, uh, okay, and whether it's allergy asthma, it's not a big asthma, or not it's a big asthma. Um, it's not always one side, it's not this all. Nowadays, we are trying to personalize medicines because uh, we're trying to uh, phenotype asthma so that we can give them the uh, proper and uh, correct treatments. Um, how to give that after you phenotype them, whether it's the autonomic or not, it's a severe inflammation then you decide what biologics you want to give to these patients. Those who have non uh, uh inflammation probably you want to go for things like tomoplasty, uh, which I think later uh, this will just a, a lecture on this. And um, more importantly, we want to tailor the biologics to the correct patients by using the biomarkers. Okay, so for, uh, as uh, take-home messages, I think I've shown you asthma is a heterogeneous disease. Um, there are various factors that determine the asthma phenotypes from the environmental factors, the genetic factors, uh, so at the lung microbiomes, all these can actually determine the different asthma phenotypes. And I've shown you that asthma phenotyping is the key to asthma, severe asthma treatment because uh, from there you decide what biologics is suitable for your patients. And even though there's a lot of cytokines and interleukins that are available, um, but the options to choose from biologics is only uh, uh, handful of their treatment. So just a summary for uh, how to formulate uh, the phenotype and biomarkers, allergy asthma, and IIG, then you might need to need to get those normally so bad. Those who have gastroenterophilic asthma, it's tight, gastroenterophils, you can use IL-5 treatments, I have more of the rally spread. Those not gastroenterophilic asthma, usually they do not have high gastroenterophil counts, then you probably need to get a lava lava or gel violin or even some colloidal antibiotics, and we can consider a good deal to go past it. Uh, just a summary of all the biologics, uh, which I'm not going to go into details, because different biologics have different indications and uh, different uses besides the CBS mark. And we have moved a long way from uh, asthma as a single disease. Now, um, you know, phenotyping asthma, trying to cluster and analyze them. And in the future, probably we need to uh, further um, manage them properly with uh, suitable biomarkers. And probably just a glimpse of what, the, what we expect in the future. Besides phenotypings, we are looking at endotypings, personalized patient profiles, and uh, from the diagnosis to the treatment aspect. Please, I thank you for your... Assalamualaikum and very good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, UITM, especially Dr. Amin, for uh, inviting me to talk this uh, afternoon. I'm actually uh, recovering from a C19 infection, uh, so still having cough uh, on and off. So just bear with me for the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the topics on severe allergic asthma. First, when I uh, received this invitation with topics, uh, I thought uh, this might not be relevant anymore, as I think Dr. Tan has uh, nicely uh, explained and described most of the things that I am going to share this afternoon as well. But anyway, I'll try to focus on a certain aspect, especially on, uh, on the diagnosis of allergy asthma as well as the selection of uh, treatment for patients with severe allergy asthma. Um, from from the uh, Dr. Tan's lecture, I think it is very clear that we have uh, progressed uh, f uh, so fast, I think, for the last uh, couple of years in terms of uh, uh, one is uh, definition, diagnosis, as well as the uh, phenotyping of the severe asthma itself. And uh, in fact, we are going to see more and more uh, coming uh, into the market, I mean, in terms of advancement in severe asthma treatment. And the severe allergy asthma may not be relevant anymore as a phenotypes. So now I think more uh, studies, more um, drugs are being targeting specific molecule rather than specific phenotypes, as, as I mentioned. 
So I think I, I don't have to explain anymore. We know that the severe asthma um, is, is a really significant group of uh, asthmatic patients up to 10% depending on which, which uh, literature review, review. So um, up to 10%, some says uh, 15%. And what is important about severe asthma is that these are the group who are suffering from uh, the disease burden, not only on themselves, but on their family as well as the burden on healthcare setting. And 75% uh, of people with suspected severe asthma do not routinely get access to specialist care and treatment. This is, again, worries us. So why do this patient being treated? And of course, uh, patients with severe asthma, they tend to be on uh, intensive therapy, including oral corticosteroid for long term. And because of this, they might develop uh, side effects as a result of oral corticosteroid being used for a long period of time. And as our commitment in HRPZ2 Kota Baru, we have uh, launched uh, officially our severe asthma clinics quite recently in, uh, in uh, conjunction with the severe asthma, uh, World Asthma Day, I think last month. So this is uh, just briefly the event officiated by our, uh, our state director of health. And uh, looking at the the title is a severe allergy asthma. We have to understand what is severe asthma. I think it's already been explained very well by uh, Prof. Andrea earlier on and by, by Dr. Tan as well. So I don't have to elaborate further on this. So before we can say a patient is having severe allergy asthma, then patient must fulfill all the criteria of severe asthma. And uh, phenotypes of the asthma, there are many phenotypes of severe asthma um, according to literatures, of course. Um, there are some based on different characteristics and based on uh, different uh, different studies or different uh, um, tests and so on. So, in with this uh, <clears throat> for this uh, lecture, I focus on severe allergy asthma, and of course, we have eosinophilic asthma, neutrophilic asthma, chronic airflow obstruction, recurrent exacerbation, phenotypes, and you have corticosteroid insensitivity. So, this is a phenotype that been uh, suggested by expert in, in this field. But whether this phenotype is, is really um, important in terms of decision making and what is the best treatment for them, it's not really clear. So because now I think the concept of T2 high, T2 low inflammation is actually predominant in terms of selection of drugs for treatment. Anyway, I'll try to elaborate further on this uh, aspect. So defining severe asthma, severe allergy asthma is, is uh, there are two, two uh, key elements when we say our patient is having severe allergy asthma. Number one, they must show there is allergic sensitization whereby there is uh, elevation of specific IgE demonstrated by skin uh, prick uh, test or elevated specific IgE in vitro test. So you have uh, there are many types of the uh, in vitro tests uh, available in the market. Uh, and uh, they must, uh, this patient must show they are sensitive, uh, elevated uh, specific IgE to at least one, one of the uh, an appropriate panel of allergen. And at the same time, the symptoms response, the res symptoms occur in response to allergen exposure. I think this is important when we decide treatment for severe allergy asthma, what is the driver of symptoms and the driver of the, uh, the exacerbation, for example. So the patient, having symptoms as well as exacerbation drive by allergic or allergens, then we can probably say that patient most likely is having uh, allergic uh, asthma. And this uh, symptom may be associated with other allergic co conditions like allergic rhinitis, eczema, or food allergy. So in, in uh, severe allergy asthma, it is expected to have increased uh, level of eosinophil in the blood, high level of phenol, as well as increased IgE. And in many studies of severe asthma, asthma you can see um, the uh, allergy asthma predominate actually more, uh, some papers are 60 up to 90% of uh, population in this study actually uh, severe asthma, severe allergy asthma based on the uh, test on aeroallergen aero that being done in these uh, various studies. However, when, when we look at the pattern of overlapping between eosinophilic as well as uh, uh, allergy asthma, then it is very obvious. This is one of the uh, biggest data actually from Italy. 
So they analyze, they estimate the number of patients that is eligible for biologic therapy, especially bupilumab. So they come out with this uh, diagram. As you can see the pie chart, you can see the overlapping between the various uh, the markers, the biomarkers like eosinophil, biomarkers of pheno, you have uh, IgE, it's allergy only. So you can have a combination of both or combination of three, uh, three um, biomarkers, for example, high eosinophil uh, count in blood, high pheno as well as allergic component, which is about a quarter of the patient in this population, which comes about 20,000 patients. So this is really important to understand is that when, when, when we think about treatment, uh, there is some component overlapping between uh, patient with eosinophilic as well as the allergy. So some of them, they have both allergy, eosinophilic, asthma. So with that, with that uh, in, in, in mind, so when we select the biologics in the future, it might change from what we have done earlier. And why, uh, what explain why there is some overlapping, I think Dr. Again, Dr. Dr. Tan has explained very well, but what I want to show here is that the role of important, uh, important molecules in, in, the, in the lung epithelial cells as well, uh, as well as in the blood, like TSLP, this is uh, thymic stromal lymphoprotein, uh, the um, T helper cell type 2 here, you have interleukin 4, interleukin 13. This is again important in terms of target molecule for biologics. And you have again the role of interleukin uh, 13 here, interleukin 5 in maturation, activation, as well as recruitment of eosinophil in eosinophilic asthma. And of course, the role of IgE uh, in, in, uh, in allergy asthma, uh, ties to mast cell, uh, degranulation, and, and uh, creates. Uh, mast cell destabilization and release of uh, histamine and many other uh, mediators in asthma that, that uh, explain the symptom of patient with asthma. So this is important to, to understand that various uh, molecule, target molecule uh, for biologics and the, the role of that molecules in, in asthma pathogenesis. So by blocking the certain uh, molecules or attach a certain molecule will get benefits of a treatment in, in biologics in, in patients with severe asthma. And as, as we mentioned earlier, earlier on, we can actually divide simply into uh, two types of, of inflammation in, in severe asthma, the type 2 or non-type 2. So in type 2 of, uh, inflammation, we can actually simplify into whether they are allergic eosinophilic asthma or they are non uh, allergic eosinophilic asthma. Why it is important? Because uh, the target molecule as well as biologic that is uh, targeting the specific molecule, molecule in treating those uh, specific asthma phenotypes and endotypes. And uh, this is to, to uh, summarize. In terms of type 2 cytokines, in, uh, in type 2 inflammation, what are the cytokines involved? Here is interleukin 4, interleukin 13, interleukin 5, because these are the target molecule of current biologics available in the market. And what are the type 2 biomarkers that uh, is available for us before we consider treatment must be measured like Ig level, specific or total Ig level, you have phenol, as well as blood eosinophil uh, level. And you have uh, at, at the uh, Asthma patient population, they can be classified either uh, allergic, uh, eosinophilic, or eosinophilic uh, severe asthma. And these are the type two, type two asthma. And in between, they also have overlapping allergy and eosinophilic uh, uh, itself. So because of this, so there is a specific treatment targeting anti uh, targeting IgA, which is anti IgA antibody or omalizumab. And there's also specific uh, treatment biologics targeting interleukin-5 or interleukin-5 receptor and specific target targeting the molecules of interleukin-4 and interleukin-13. So you can see the, the benefits of blocking or targeting the molecules in terms of treating allergic eosinophilic asthma as well as allergic, uh, as well as eosinophilic uh, asthma. So this is important in decision making when, when we decide for the best treatment for, for a patient with severe asthma. And this is to, just to share with you all, when we say uh, a patient on biologics, there are many biologics, uh, not only for asthma, they're for rheumatoid arthritis, they're for psoriasis, there's for many other diseases. But uh, if you look at the uh, 
in term potential for immunologic uh, re reaction depends on how they name it. For example, if they are uh, if they are originated from murine, it's uh, OMAP at the end of the uh, of the words, and chimery is is 65% uh, human. And uh, if it is humanized uh, kind of monoclonal antibody like in omalizumab, it is 90% uh, human. And if it is a fully, uh, fully uh, human or 100% human, which is, uh, for example, dupilumab, uh, it, is, uh, it is actually uh, fully humanized and it is less potential in terms of uh, uh, having immunology reaction uh, to a patient. How do we approach a patient with severe uh, allergy or severe asthma? Because I, I cannot separate it from uh, management of uh, overall management of severe asthma from severe allergy asthma because uh, uh, consideration is, is, is actually, we have to look at the factors, the many factors altogether. So first, of course, assessment and biomarker testing, this is a must. So we have to confirm the patient is having uh, asthma and severe asthma. We have confirmed the patient is uh, ad, uh, adhere to the treatment with the standard of care. And of course, testing the, uh, bio, the biomarkers that is necessary for decision making. And when, when we consider treatment, it's always good to have a guideline uh, based therapy for us to rely on. So because uh, there are some, some red flags uh, for therapeutic failures. So what to do when, when the drug fails to, to reach the therapeutic uh, target or if there is pres presence of side effects and the needs for add-on controllers or other new therapies or whether we need to discontinue the in ineffective therapies of a pa what a patient has been on. And following that, we, we uh, appropriately we have to select the patient uh, for stepping up or stepping down the treatment, especially uh, especially looking at the biologics or uh, bronchial tumultuosity in a specific patient. So uh, there are many factors uh, that we look into that before we decide which biologics is, is, is uh, suitable for our patient. And other than that, when the patient is uh, started on any treatment, of course, look at the potential long-term disease mod modification, especially talking about biologics is possible. But at the current moment, we do not have any drugs probably offering um, disease modifica modification of asthma uh, throughout the treatment of uh, severe asthma. This is uh, taken from Gina to 2022. So to summarize, so, uh, for a patient with severe allergic asthma, of course, severe, severe allergic asthma is part of the, uh, it's type two inflamed, uh, type two asthma. So make sure we confirm that our patient is having type two uh, inflammations. For example, measuring blood usual pill count in more than 150 per microliter and the phenol more than 20, sputum usual pill uh, if available more than 2% and asthma is driven, uh, clinically uh, allergen driven as I mentioned. As being mentioned by Dr. Tan, of course, we cannot rely on one single uh, single levels of the eosinophil and phenol. So it, it can be repeated multiple times to, to get the, the best uh, result because a lot of influence, uh, a lot of things that can influence the level of eosinophil as well as phenol when you measure it. And once uh, we, we did that, the patient belongs to type 2, type 2 with uh, allergic component, then we look at other factors are adherence, uh, where the patient has been optimized on ICS dose again, and whether there's any, any form of uh, non-biologic treatment which is available, treating the comorbidities associated with asthma. This is also important before, before putting patient on biologic therapy, which is very expensive. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, once, uh, once we did that, then we look at whether do we have biologics? This is again a question uh, of availability, whether we can provide the treatment for patients. It's expensive, it's not readily available. And of course, in Malaysia, only I think recently we have at least uh, three or four um, biologics available for, for patients to be considered. And if available, then for severe allergy asthma in GINA guidelines, it is recommended to use anti IgE, which is omalizumab, as a treatment of choice. Uh, but the patient must, must be. Um, within the uh, uh, total serum IgE level weight within the dosage range, and they have uh, positive sensitization or skin prick test or specific IgE. And uh, there are factors that may predict asthma, good asthma response to anti-IgE. For example, the higher blood eosinophil uh, levels, higher, uh, higher level of phenol, 
and there is positive allergen-driven symptom as well as early onset of the asthma. That gives us a clue the patient will probably benefit and with a good response towards NTIG, which is omalizumab. What about other drugs? We'll talk about that later. So once we, we select the drugs, then of course, uh, we review the response. We, uh, in uh, four months, for example, then assess the response. If they have good response, we follow them, uh, follow them up accordingly. And this is again, uh, what are the criteria for uh, anti-IgE in severe allergy asthma? Of course, as mentioned earlier on, it's, it's predictors of good response if patient is early onset, allergen driven, high level of phenol, high blood usopy count, uh, together with, with a positive uh, skin prick, as well as a specific uh, elevated specific IgE uh, level in, in their blood. And they must be within the uh, total serum IgE and weight within the dosage range. What, what, what about if the, the level of serum IgE and weight out of range? Does this patient benefit from, from uh, treatment with, uh, with this biology or malizumab or there's an alternative for, for that? Just before that, um, I think the studies and evidence for omalizumab or anti-IG antibody has been many years, I think more than, it's close to 20 years, even our experience in uh, HRP2, more than 10 years, is, is really good for properly selected patient, properly selected severe uh, allergy asthma. So they, re they really reduce significantly the exacerbation has been shown in this uh, experience registry, which is about two years. Um, real life, uh, this is a real world uh, experience, a single, um, yeah, this is uh, uncontrolled persistence uh, allergy asthma where the patient was put on omalizumab, they follow up for two years, they look at the uh, significant exacerbation clinically or severe clinically significant exacerbation reduction. And at the end of two years, you can see there is a drop in the uh, number, mean number of exacerbation from almost five pre-treatment to less than one uh, at, at uh, two years of treatment of omalizumab. And again, at, at over 24 months of uh, treatment with omalizumab, you can see there's patients with no asthma uh, exhibition, almost, uh, you can see uh, this is pre-treatment and post-treatment you can see it's up to 90% of them. So there is significant uh, reduction in exacerbation, severe or clinically significant uh, uh, exacerbation while patient on omalizumab throughout the treatment for two years. And one of the problem with severe asthma, the patient uh, tend to be on oral corticosteroid for um, repeatedly as well as for a long period of time that predisp predispose them to a side effect of steroid. So what we want to see the benefit of um, using biologics is reduction of oral corticosteroid during their treatment. As you can see here, up to two years, reduction of the patient's number of patients on on maintenance, OCS dropped from 28.6 20, to 14.2 uh, at, at two years. And total daily dose, mean total daily dose also dropped from 15.5 milligram uh, per day to 5.8 milligram per day. So this this actually evidence to support that the omalizumab in severe allergy asthma actually uh, um, improve the patient's condition, reduce exacerbation, and reduce the need for oral corticosteroid in the long term. And there are many meta-analyses as well as the, the uh, this is one of the meta-analyses of 86 real world studies for, for many years, for 13 years, and it is summarized that the omalizumab in severe allergic uh, asthma patient increase lung function, increase uh, improve asthma control, improve quality of life, and decrease exacerbation, reduce ED visits, hospitalization, reduce the need for OCS and other therapies, and reduce the healthcare resource utilization. And a summary of outcomes for many real world studies was omalizumab also proved that the properly, properly selected patient with severe uh, allergy asthma um, with omalizumab exacerbation reduced uh, OCS uh, sparing effect and reduction of symptom as well as improved quality of life has been uh, seen in this slide. And of course, we, we, we also had a patient who was actually pregnant while on omalizumab. So our first experience having patient pregnant while on omalizumab with severe allergy asthma, but 
that our patient also part of the uh, registry, then this is important for us to consider in a patient with really severe allergy asthma, there is consideration that can be, uh, can be put for patient uh, with severe asthma, having symptom, having exacerbation, they're pregnant. So there is a safety, um, safety, um, of course, previously there was safety concern in, in pregnant patient. But however, with this registry of pregnant lady of uh, 250 pregnant women exposed to, to uh, one or more uh, malizuma, there's no significant uh, major congenital anomalies as compared to uh, those uh, pregnant patient without uh, malizuma. And again, the safety profile, there is no signal of increased increase, uh, risk of malignancy over five years of uh, follow-up in external studies. And so what about other, other drugs in severe allergy asthma? As I said, there is component of overlap between severe allergy asthma as well as severe allergy eosinophilic asthma. There has been many studies, especially looking at the post hoc analysis of uh, various uh, molecules or various drugs, including mepolizumab. In this uh, study, which is a uh, post hoc analysis of brain trial, as you can see, whether the patient's atopic or non atopic exacerbation rate per year, it is far, um, it is a better mepolizumab compared to placebo, of course, but there is significant, um, the impact of reduction in exacerbation over one year treatment period. It's not different, uh, it's the same whether the patient's atopic or non-atopic. It means that the patient's allergic or non-allergic, if their eosinophil count is high, so mepolizumab works in, in, in this uh, condition. What about benralizumab? Also has been seen, this is uh, another uh, post hoc analysis of uh, benralizumab study. So in this uh, study, for patients with at least uh, 300 eosinophil uh, per micro, uh, microliter who met the atopy and IG criteria, the benralizumab decreased exacerbation by 46%. For patients with uh, eosinophilia and high or low IgE, so benralizumab resulted in in 42% in, uh, and 43% decrease in exacerbation respectively. As you can see, there is no difference whether the patients have been atopy, high AGE or low AGE, the benralizumab works in, in this scenario. Dupilumab, dupilumab also has been shown in another post hoc analysis of the um, uh, Liberty uh, study. So you can see here, uh, regardless of the whether, whether the patients have been allergic asthma or non-allergic asthma, you can see reduction of the uh, annu adjusted annualized severe exacerbation uh, rate in, in the patient um, who is allergic here, and this is a patient without evidence of allergy. So there is no difference whether the patient is allergic or non-allergic in a patient with uh, uh, severe uh, eosinophilic uh, asthma responds well to dupilumab. What about the latest drugs, tazepilumab? Because you know tazepilumab uh, is actually the agent actually targeting the TSLP, which is uh, far in the uh, upstream um, of the inflammatory, uh, inflammatory cascade of the asthma. So as you can see, there is the, uh, regardless of whether the patient's indicated for omalizumab for allergic asthma or not, the uh, benefits of uh, tazepilumab actually uh, beyond that, you can see, uh, in all category of patient, whether they are uh, omalizumab eligible or non-eligible, uh, whether they are in EU or in US, so the patient actually respond better uh, towards tazepilumab in terms of reduction of exacerbation over one year. And again, the other studies also have shown the same uh, pattern uh, in terms of the improvement of lung function. You can see here there is improvement of lung function uh, in favor of tazepilumab as compared to, to placebo in various uh, different group of patients, whether they, uh, they have shown allergy or they don't have any allergy evidence. And again, looking at the um, change from baseline uh, pre-bronchodilator FEV1 also has been shown in this one-year study. You can see here this uh, tazepilumab uh, with, with uh, allergic, allergic um, component or tazepilumab without allergic uh, evidence. You can see, of course, it's, uh, it's better than placebo in terms of uh, 
significant improvement of uh, change from baseline broco free bronchodilator FPV1, but regardless of their status, whether they are allergic or non-allergic, they respond very well. And in su summary of the uh, recommendation of drugs, according to guidelines, you can see GINA 2021, ERS uh, ATS uh, 2019, and EA ACI 2021. This is uh, European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. So you can see the difference in terms of the uh, allergic, severe allergy asthma uh, recommendation of drugs. GINA recommends uh, omalizumab as the the, uh, the only treatment for severe allergy asthma. And there's no recommendation uh, for the other um, the other drugs, like mepolizumab, resilizumab, benrazumab, and dupilumab. At this time, I think the tazepilumab is not approved by FDA yet. But if you look at the ERS and the ATS, also the same. It's only omalizumab is indicated for patients with, with uh, um, allergic severe asthma. But in, EA, uh, in European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, you can see the, of course, omalizumab is indicated for allergic, severe allergy asthma with evidence of total IgA and evidence of one or more perennial aeroallergen evidence. And as well as the, there is benefits of giving benralizumab as well as dupilumab in a patient who's allergic, as well as having uh, blood eosinophilic more than 300 cells or a patient with 150 cells with atopy and total IgE, high total IgE level. And for dupilumab, it is also recommended to, to, uh, to consider dupilumab in patient with um, uh, blood eosinophilic count of more than 150 50, and pheno more than 20 part per billion. So again, this is, of course, looking at the previous post, post hoc analysis, I think it doesn't really matter whether the patient with uh, high eosinophil, whether they have allergic or non-allergic that works. Uh, it works well with, with uh, all those drugs I mentioned. I think I, I've mentioned uh, um, in terms of overall approach to a patient with severe allergic asthma, then uh, I've mentioned the overlap between phenotypes and endotypes in patients with allergy eosinophilic and allergy asthma. So it is important consideration when we treat our patient. It's not just uh, allergy asthma, it's not a distinct uh, phenotypes that by itself uh, needs the, the only treatment, the, the one and only treatment. So there's no uh, single drug that's fit to, to anyone. So we still have to consider many other factors. Nowadays, the measuring interpret and interpreting biomarkers of T2 inflammation correctly is, is really important for, is part of integral of the, uh, how we select, how we treat our patient with severe asthma. And the, of course, other consideration need to be uh, take into place as well in the patient other than biomarkers. We need to consider comorbidities associated with asthma and of course the cost and availability of the drugs is also crucial in, 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 in uh, decision making uh, in order to, to, uh, to get the best response from biologic treatment for patients with severe allergy asthma. I think with that, I uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you for your... Uh Okay, thank you very much, Amin. I'm Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, so I am going to speak a little bit on severe eosinophilic asthma. I actually managed to listen to what Tan and Mazuki had presented, and there are just so many overlapping uh, presentations. So I'll be very quick, and I know that the participants are new to this concept, so we make it very kind, very easy, and very relaxed for people to understand because I will be repeating many of what has been said. Maybe one of one or two of my slides are new to you, but they are not new slides, but I'll make it very easy and simple because at the end of it, at least we have an impression of what severe, severe eosinophilic asthma is. This is the summary of the presentation. So asthma actually is a journey. We have been through this from the 60s. Now we are in 2020s, it is extremely exciting time because we understand a lot more, but as we understand more, we realize there are also so many more that we don't understand. 
what we thought was this now has become something else. What we thought was clear description of a phenotype that we realize is actually not as easy as that. So the journey has been very uh, interesting. Uh, we began with bronchospasm and then we went on to inflammation and then we went on to asthma control and then personalized therapy. Now we are into individualized treatment and we understand the phenotype of asthma. And although it is a progression, but the way science works, but the way science works sometimes is very tangential or algorithmic. I, sometimes it goes fairly quickly once we understand a concept by accident as it were. But still, asthma is still the airway that is chronically inflamed and has these following features. You have airway hyperresponsiveness. We have airway remodeling. Now we understand a little bit more. We see goblet cell hyperplasia and mucus overproduction. And all of these are key observations in the disease. And they have a meaning to how we look at the disease in a way. And these consequences give the clinical consequences in real life wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, coughing. And if you measure uh, airway obstruction, we can see from the reduction in FEV1, and they get exacerbation by the way that they require treatment over and above their maintenance treatment. So the pathophysiology are those, but there are many diseases that may cause the same pathophysiological consequences. And therefore you can understand the consequences are numerous and therefore needs to be understood slightly more precisely. This is the kind of the kind of understanding that we have now, which will remain with us for foreseeable future. I.e., we have type two and non-type two, and within those categories, we have those who are allergic, eosinophilic, exercise-induced, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, and then you have the non-type two which we thought we understood by those with obesity, very late onset, those postgranulocytic or neutrophilic with smoking related asthma. All these little phenotypes will give us understanding of what they are. And because type two is so predominant and important in asthma, it is characterized by GINA in 2021 as one that is characterized by the cytokine four, five and 13. And this is produced by the adaptive, adaptive immune systems on recognition of allergen. And it is also characterized by uh, eosinophils, biomarkers, phenol, and they may have history of atopy. And those with non-type 2 are often neutrophilic. Although this concept is being challenged and there's a lot of debate as to the veracity of this. And we see that type two is very predominant. I would say in real life, if you have a patient that is difficult to control, then you are really by default looking at type two inflammation in the asthma. So it goes through mild to moderate, you know, at least half, maybe more, uncontrolled asthma despite on stage four or five GINA, very high incidence, more than 50% with type two, and in those with severe asthma, you have higher proportion. So type two is really the predominant type that is existing, especially in those difficult to control, severe asthma, uncontrolled asthma. So you're looking at very high incidence of type two. And the way that people have characterized the inflammation are variable, of course. They use at IgE, eosinophils, or the induced sputum, which is more difficult and how genes themselves are being expressed in the epithelium to see that the change to type two inflammation. This is the definition, if you want to go by definition, what is type two high, allergic, and eosinophilic. So any one of these would be corresponding to the definition by the European society. This is fairly recent in 2021. And how do we deal with this? again, has been uh, repeated many times. You have to go through the diagnosis. And if you look at GINA, there's a very clear emphasis of uh, assess, adjust, and review. The same with us, yeah? you need to assess. 
is it really the diagnosis of severe asthma? And then you would see for the presence of comorbidities, risk factor, trigger factors, and then address all those. And then you would look at the endotyping and phenotyping. And depending on those, think about the treatment that will be best approaching severe asthma. Many of this has been said, so I'll be very quickly. So what are the ongoing issues? I'm going to just briefly tell you about the updates, which uh, Matsuki has already explained, so I'll explain very uh, briefly. And then the issue of overlap. All, the, all these definitions are definite in, term of class, in terms of classification, but in real life, they overlap. In fact, in a patient, they can have both uh, a few phenotypes, depending on whether they're stable, they have an exacerbation, or whatever other factors that come in, they may have a viral infection from the adaptive immunity, they go on to type two, or maybe if they are instigated by another uh, instigation, then they can go on to a slightly different cell type. So these things are happening and people are looking at whether we should be looking at this in a more open-minded way. So, and then the presence of comorbidities is very important. And then the, the concept in severe asthma of super responders, which lead to clinical rem, rem, remission. This is the uh, key changes in 2020. And uh, for those who are being given OCS and they have treatment for, for the, the severe asthma with biologic, it is recommended that you should screen for adrenal insufficiency once you are on the path of reducing the OCS. And also, also you would have seen the Ponente study, this is by Bandralizumab, where they designed an algorithm for how patient could be safely reduced of the OCS. And the good news is that majority of the patient will be able to be reduced, but they are guided by morning cortisol, shots, nectin test, and wait and see if they fail the shots and action test and morning cortisol screening test. And then the other uh, changes would be if you have high eosinophil, you need to consider infection by strongyloides, which are often asymptomatic. So by doing some immunofluorescent tests, and you should be able to be happy that there is no incipient ongoing strongyloides infection that explains why eosinophil is high. And then of course, as has been said, as a matter of a strategy, Gina says, if you are above 1,500, which could also be because of eosinophilically driven asthma, you should really be investigating the presence of uh, extrinsic, uh, sorry, eosinophilic granulomatosis polyangiitis or the, the old Wagner's granulomatosis uh, condition. And then you should really be careful with your assessment. You should be prepared to repeat or go back to the notes and to see where the status of the patient is. And then uh, I just tell you the, the guideline uh, updates that LAMA is kind of firmly established either in track one and track two. If you have symptoms on medium or high dose ICS LAMA, then you should consider LAMA as a treatment before you assess that they are having symptoms despite maximum of treatment. And of, of, and of course, low-dose azithromycin is also an option in the treatment for stage 5 GINA severe asthma. And then there is also the addition of a dupilumab on those, especially with uh, high oral corticosteroids, and anti thymic stroma lymphopoietin, which is tazepilumab, for the treatment of those with severe asthma, regardless of the eosinophil level. And again, I'm, I'm suggest uh, sorry, I'm repeating this again. Uh, so, children are also a proof of dupilumab, which uh, in Malaysia has been used a lot with atopic dermatitis. Uh, quite a number of patients with this condition on this biologic more than the asthmatic variety. But if you can have a patient or a child with both conditions, then it would be ideal to get on dupilumab on the treatment. 
And again, a TSLP, I don't know whether this is going to come very soon, probably very unlikely. And this is also on the market and seems to target epithelium der derived cytokines higher on the process and whatever comes after that, which is IL-5 or 4 and 13, it seems to be more generic approach for the treatment for asthma and goes beyond the level of eosinophil for the treatment selection. And then the table is actually from uh, Gina. What I wanted to highlight to you, the table is the other indication bit. So just go beyond asthma and see whether they should all be considered the treatment if they have other indications. And again, uh, Matsuki have explained this clearly, so I'm not going to go through this, but this is one that we uh, can look at. I advise uh, you that you can refer to Gina simply because they are very serious in ensuring data comes to us. They look at the data diligently twice a year and they would come up with this uh, suggestion as a guide in terms of strategy for clinicians. So looking through the recommendation by Gina will be a very good idea in trying to understand this very difficult disease and very complex in its management at times. And again, you know, the consideration of anti-IgE, anti-IL-5 or anti-IL-5 receptor and then anti-IL-4 and then anti-TSLP would then come in handy for, for the consideration for treatment. So you can use this as your guide for the treatment decision in looking for patient in severe asthma. Yeah. Okay, uh, it has been said by the previous speaker, but you know, it is nice to say they are allergic and eosinophilic, but this is a nice uh, paper. When I quoted this, I think it was in publication where it shows the overlap between the two conditions. Either it is overlap or patients themselves express the phenotype differently in different occasions or in different scenarios during exacerbation, during maintenance phase, or where there are controlled, they may have different overlap. You can see this in various clusters of patients with severe asthma. When you look at one, they tend to have the markers of the other two. Just to show the overlap is real, and perhaps it explains why the choice of a biologic may not be enough for that patient because of the way the treatment and the cells are affecting the disease. And again, this is just a repeat. When you look at those with atopic or eosinophilic, they will have both characteristics present within them, significant enough to put you off and thinking, hey, am I really addressing the primary driver for disease? Is it the atopic or is it the eosinophilic? You must be prepared to change your mind. For example, in absence of response to treatment, to another because you can just uh, assess the other treatment and if it doesn't get better then you can go back to what it was previously and again this has already been explained you can see where they are and look at the TSLP which is just behind the epithelium and it affects very similar cells too you know in the end it, it activates the eosinophils so they they do share a lot of uh, pathways within the process and again in the non-allergenic and non-eosinophilic, they can all both lead to remodeling by different cells, different processes, but the end result are almost similar. And again, if you look at the cytokines and biomarkers within asthma, they are also responsible for other diseases too. You need to remember, we need to remember this all the time. So when we see the patient with asthma, we realize that the symptoms they may have or they have may sometimes be explained by, by what we are looking at and investigating during the asthma consultation and investigation. Again, yeah, I'm, I'm repeating this, but I'm just showing you the cartoon slide just to highlight to you, they are driven by the same cytokines and the same biomarkers. So think about them in the way that it will affect the patient in the treatment choice. And again, this is even more dramatic <clears throat> illustration where the cells are similar and they can exist within the patient. Okay, uh, 
we are this this is a very old paper 2017 but in terms of survey as much it will be very old because it moves so quickly uh, by roland ball uh, the the german who wrote that we need to think about the response in this way are they super responders four months is enough and then if they're not responding you should stop treatment and change something else and this is the paper by hitasha in jackie practice uh, last year, end of last year, and she uh, suggested that when you define the new par paradigm for control, then you need to rely on these four things. How are we affecting the steroid? Are we actually reducing the exacerbation and in fact eliminating it? How does the patient feel, for example, ACT, and how does the lung function? So you need to include all those when you, you give patient expensive treatment, all these four parameters must be there. Oh, sorry. And this is, uh, Menzies Gao has suggested to be the criteria for, for the remission. Yeah? Just for you to, to look at later, like it doesn't have to be now. And this is how he has adopted in pool post hoc analysis of patient on bendalizumab. He defined clinical remission of those who have symptom improvement, uh, zero exacerbation, no steroids, Increase in FEV1, so you must have an increase in FEV1, pre bronchodilator of about 100, and that would define clinical remission in the study that they have published. I think this was published uh, beginning of this year, where they can actually look at those on bendalizumab and see a significant number with clinical remission based on the symptoms. So, what is the future? So, that's why I say I didn't want to talk too much because a lot have been said. There's a lot we do not know. And type two really is both allergic and eosinophilic. And eosinophils seem to be very important in both. They have a lot of overlap. And our precision medicine, however, requires very predictive biomarkers. And the presence of comorbidities are important for the choice of treatment. And we are really moving towards understanding remission in those who respond favorably to biologics. And of course, the issue that beset us a cost, the experience, but I can be, be, I mean, we can all testify that the experience is increasing cumulatively very quickly indeed. And local guidelines, I think it's important because to me, we cannot just simply replicate what the study shows. We should really choose the patient that would benefit most from this expensive drug perhaps in the severe and super responder category. And then we sh really should be serious. And this also goes to me, our real world evidence for the efficacy for policy and decision making for the use of biology and in severe asthma. I think that's all I have to say. So thank you very much. For Dr. Jamalul is a chest physician based in uh, Sudan Hospital. He just come back from um, JB, uh, managing an um, emergency case this morning. Um, Dr. Jamalul, I hope you have a good rest prior to the presentation after the long Thank travel. You. Thank you very much, uh, oh, Dr. Yes. Amin. Yeah, Thank you very much um, for inviting me. Um, to share my uh, experience in bronchitomoplasty uh, in Malaysia. Can you all see my my slides? The yes, Dr. Jamalul. Yes. yes. Okay, that's fine. Um, I apologize for the technical glitches earlier. And um, uh, as Dr. Amin said, I just, I just arrived from Hospital Sultana Amina JB um, about two hours ago, actually, um, doing... Um, Rigid bronchoscopy and stenting actually on on a young uh, patient with uh, TB stenosis. Um, patient had been on ventilator for more than two months, so we had to do something to uh, liberate her from um, um, from um, uh, from the ventilator. Actually. So the top uh, the topic is severe. You know, is bronchitomoplasty for 
severe asthma and um, as evidence um, that um, that's uh, the group there um, yesterday in the 14th of June um, me myself and uh, my specialist Dr. Wan Jan Lai eh, you can recognize um, Dr. Suraya there the pulmonologist there and uh, the ENT surgeon on my left actually in our view so we were doing uh, um, a case uh, in the OT for seven hours actually uh, trying to uh, um, do a dilatation and put a stand and uh, um, so, and we managed to put a stand successfully and the patient is currently doing well and um, hopefully um, she will be extubated very soon and I think this is um, going to be our practice in the future the Serdang interventional pulmonology team we will be visiting uh, the major hospital um, within our coverage eh, to, so that uh, it is more convenient for patients um, to uh, get the, the procedure. All right. Um, so uh, please forgive me if I sound a bit tired. Eh? Uh, it was uh, almost four hours drive. Eh? All right. So um, no conflict of interest. Um, in my presentation and I won't be discussing off-label uses. So these are the objectives um, of my talk to evaluate uh, advances in bronchotomoplasty for severe asthma and uh, in particular looking at the uh, data from clinical trials and registries and patient selection and uh, if I have time then we can um, go over the procedural aspects and the number of activations. So we start with the difficult asthma case and way back uh, in 20, 2013, um, a young um, female with a child, history of childhood asthma, um, totally uncontrolled uh, with um, at least four intubations and um, already on optimal uh, medical therapy then. And finally, you know, she was prescribed oral steroid and became pushing oil. Then uh, ultimately she was referred uh, to Serdang um, in 2013 for, bron for consideration for bronchial tomoplasty. So um, just a question uh, to the audience after addressing comorbidities, triggers and inhaler technique, what would be the next step in the management? Uh, would you start omelizumab, epilumab or macrolides? Bronchotomoplasty now, or only occur bronchotomoplasty if FE1 is more than 50%. So you can think about um, uh, the, the, your answers and we'll see what uh, was the, uh, the, uh, the management um, in the end. Right, so I'm not going to uh, dive into CV, the definition of severe asthma. I believe it was well covered by by uh, Prof. Andrea, and also the definition of difficult to treat asthma, the difference between severe asthma and difficult to treat asthma, uh, everybody um, um, uh, would have understood at this stage. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going into the treatment option for severe asthma, um, which are either monoclonal antibodies or bronchial thermoplasty. And bron monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies have been uh, covered um, uh, extensively by the previous speakers. Uh, so I'm just going to speak on bronchial thermoplasty. So what's the origin um, uh, of, uh, uh, of this procedure? Well, um, in the mid 70s actually, um, uh, some people um, enough felt that if uh, we could do something uh, to the airway smooth muscle, perhaps we could um, offer some treatment uh, for severe asthma. But um, uh, we, we know that um, uh, the airway smooth muscle is not, is not just a mechanical, uh, you know, um, uh, it's not just the, the mechanical effect eh, on, the, um, on the airway. Um, we know that uh, the airway smooth muscle uh, also plays a role in bronchoconstriction, hyperresponsiveness, inflammation, um, remodeling and interaction um, with nerves and all leading to um, 
uncontrolled asthma. So this is uh, what it looked like. Um, and uh, there is uh, airway remodeling in patients um, with uh, severe uncontrolled asthma on the right panel there. You see um, um, uh, someone with severe asthma. You see the, you see the smooth muscle, hyperplasia and hypertrophy. Uh, in contrast, uh, in, in someone with normal airway, no asthma, then there is no uh, hyperplasia or, or hypertrophy of the airway smooth muscle. So, um, so what is uh, bronchial thermoplasty there? Okay. So, uh, it, bronchial thermoplasty or BT for short. Or short, uh, is a novel um, non-pharmacological therapy. Um, it involves application of uh, radio frequency energy to the airways, and basically it is a debulking procedure to reduce the airway smooth muscle mass. And uh, based on the, on one uh, pivotal study, um, it was uh, FDA approved uh, in April 2010 for treatment of severe persistent asthma. And we, which is uh, inadequately controlled despite treatment with uh, uh, high dose ICS and LABA. So what is the, in, in the BT system there? As you can see there, you have a system here that uh, generates the energy and then uh, uh, the operator will use uh, a catheter, uh, which is inserted into the working panel of the standard uh, flexible bronchoscope. And, uh, when the, the proximal uh, end of the, of the catheter is actuated, then all right, the distal end there will expand with an electrode uh, or the four electrode arrays you know, will expand with come in contact with the AV, with the with the mucosa. We, we know that the AV is most possible just underneath the mucosa there, and then the, the system will generate uh, the Heat um, to reduce the uh, to reduce the airway smooth muscle under the mucosa. All right, and this was shown demonstrated in 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 a canine model. Okay, what happened to the airways treated with bronchial thermoplasty? So, um, as you can see here, okay, at uh, the right. Um, Main bronchus there was not treated with bronchothermoplasty. The left uh, was treated with bronchothermoplasty, and uh, with the metacholine challenge, and we know that um, metacholine is is an agent used for in bronchial provocation tests. Uh, in Serdang, we do have the um, the service, um, and um, so uh, you can see there the airway that was not treated with bronchothermoplasty developed uh, bronchospasm. Okay, and on the left side there, uh, yellow arrow, you can see that in the, the airway that was treated with bronchitum plus remain remained uh, open. So, um, so what do you do in the initial presentation of, uh, of a case of uncontrolled or difficult uh, asthmatic? So the question that, that I mean, the answer is, it is not a bronchitum or plasty, okay? So you don't jump to bronchitum or plasty. You have to. Uh, I think that the, the most important question is, is this really asthma? We have seen, uh, we have received uh, referrals huh, from um, uh, many, uh, many hospitals. And uh, when we analyze, uh, we assess the patient, uh, the patient actually had all sorts of things, lung fibrosis, you know, um, 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 COPD, emphysema, and uh, I remember there was one patient from from Kuwait actually, you know, who came all the way, um, referred by his doctor, all bronchial thermoplasty. The patient arrived in Serdang, and um, we thought we were going to, you know, uh, offer bronchial thermoplasty, but the symptoms actually were due to pleural effusion. So we ended up doing fluoroscopy on this patient from the Middle East, right? So, um, so. Um, a bit disappointing for me because I thought I would earn, you know, one million, you know, well, I would get, you know, gold, uh, you know, um, uh, 
a gold medal or something from the Middle East, but no, actually. You know. So, um, so it is really important to be sure that you are dealing with asthma. And then uh, the common, the, the basic things that you, we, we need to know uh, as a uh, clinician, eh? um, poor mobilities, you know, um, whether um, education is adequate, site management, all the things that we, we already know. Okay, so all this, uh, like, you know, environmental and um, occupational triggers, all these uh, basic things must be addressed eh, before we refer, uh, the, you know, uh, the patient for bronchial thermoplasty. So the early studies were performed on dogs, uh, left-hand side there, dogs, eh, airways, which were untreated. On the right-hand side there, uh, the dogs, airways, uh, treated with bronchial thermoplasty, so you can see the difference there. Okay, there's lots of this reduction in the airway smooth muscle um, uh, in in the uh, in the treated airway. So uh, from the uh, early studies there, um, it led to three human trials: um, Fox one, the air trial, and then RISA trial. And so uh, all these, uh, perhaps the RISA trial uh, at the bottom there is probably the one that uh, we, you know, you know that uh, we, we really hope that we can, you know, offer bronchial thermoplasty. Eh? So the, um, the, you see there in the, in the RISA study there, they, they, you know, the, the, the patients were, uh, were, you know, in the severe refractory asthma. All right. And then so there was improvement um, uh, in the various aspects, eh? um, airway hyperresponsiveness in a COX-1 study. And the S, S uh, study that showed, you know, uh, uh, revealed there was decrease in, in, you know, there was a decrease in, in, in terms of uh, mild exacerbation in AQLQ, in, improvement in AQLQ. And in the research study there, you know, the, the severe forms of asthma there, there was a reduction uh, in, in, the in the rescue use and improvement in AQ AQLQ. So what did not change eh, was, uh, was the FEV1. And then the, all the three trials there uh, shared a uh, common uh, adverse effect, um, worsening of uh, asthma symptoms uh, after the procedure. And, and this, uh, after the three human trial there, it led to um, uh, the, this uh, pivotal trial, the AIR2 trial, a one-year study, which led to the FDA approval. Um, so uh, it was uh, an, an interesting uh, study. Uh, it, it was, the patient were randomized in two to one fashion. Um, uh, one group received bronchothermoplasty. The, the, the other group received sham bronchothermoplasty, meaning um, the, um, the operator uh, would um, introduce the catheter into the, into the airway and then we'll, we'll press, uh, um, uh, we'll, de we'll deliver um, the sound uh, that's, no, no, that mimic bronchial thermoplasty, but actually there was no thermal energy delivered uh, in the, through the catheter in the sham group. All right, so as you can see there, um, there are the, the, the patients uh, enrolled into this study there included uh, even allergic uh, asthma. Um, uh, FV1 had to be more than 60% of predicted and the patient had to be stable for at least uh, four weeks. Then obviously they excluded uh, those with history of life-threatening asthma and history of uh, uh, many exacerbation or, or hospitalization in, in the previous year. And these are the findings uh, of the AIR2 trial there. The primary endpoint was the a AQLQ and uh, so as you can see there, almost 80% of the BT treated group, uh, uh, you know, uh, achieved changes in AQLQ more than 0 0.5. But surprisingly, uh, the shams, uh, the sham group there, also showed uh, a very good uh, improvement uh, in in AQLQ. Uh. So the, uh, you know, so the, the study was criticized because of the because of the, uh, you know, a, a large placebo effect in the sham group there. However, when you look at uh, the secondary endpoints, um, go to the 
second point there, uh, in, in the post-treatment period, uh, six to 52 weeks after bronchitomoplasty, the BT group had fewer uh, severe exacerbations, 32%, and uh, a massive reduction in emergency room visit, uh, 84% compared to the, uh, the sham uh, uh, subject. However, 6% um, of, of the BT subjects, uh, um, those uh, subjects uh, who received uh, BT were hospitalized in the treatment period, so meaning they, they had um, uh, worsening of asthma. Okay, and which is not surprising, obviously, uh, when uh, you do bronchoscopy on somebody with uh, uh, asthma. And so, um, and a lot of people were not happy with the findings of the air two, of the air two trial. They claimed the study was too short, only 12 months, and then severe asthmatic were uh, excluded. Only FEV1 of more than 60% were, um, were included uh, uh, in, in the study. Okay, and then uh, uh, you know the, the huge placebo effect uh, in the sham uh, in the sham uh, group there. All right, so uh, so uh, they decided uh, to follow up uh, this patient for another five years. You know? uh, so it's, it is called air two extension study. So patients uh, who underwent BT in the air two trial will follow up annually for five years uh, to assess the safety and durability of the treatment effect. And uh, those are those are the outcome assessment, TV exacerbation, adverse event, parametric uh, CT scan. But uh, again, eh, the study was uh, criticized because there was no follow up in the shame subject. And uh, as you can see here, there is there is there was a very good retention uh, in the air two trial there, air two extension study there. Uh, just imagine to follow up a patient for five years. You know? Okay, so I think. Almost uh, more than 90% of the patients were seen uh, up to five years in the air to extension study. And what, the, what are the findings there? So as the, you can see here, um, the, basically um, you can see the, the, the sustained effect uh, of BP uh, up to five years. Okay? Um, no matter which way you look at it, uh, whether uh, uh, reduction in CV exacerbation or reduction in ER visits, okay? The, the improvement was maintained out to five years. So, so what else is new about bronchiectomoplasty? Well, uh, a couple of studies uh, published that showed that um, no matter what, what was the initial uh, smooth muscle mass, Okay, you will get um, this, you know the, the same amount of reduction in um, in uh, in airway smooth muscle mass after the bronchiectomoplasty. So this is another evidence uh, to show that um, you know, there is reduction in airway smooth muscle mass after bronchiectomoplasty. So what about real life studies? You know, so a lot of studies being conducted in various countries: Japan, Canada, uh, Australia, UK. Um, U.S. and and so all the studies shared, uh, uh, you know, three things in common. So there was improvement in AQLQ and severe exacerbation, and a number of. Um, I think there was there, there was a study from Australia which showed that the number of activation has a role in responsiveness, meaning that the higher the number of, of activation during bronchiectomoplasty, the better the response and. Um, not surprisingly, you know, um, a higher percentage eh, of patients, um, um, you know, uh, visit the emergency room, um, 11 to 11 to 22 percent um, of the patient in, in, the, in the real life studies you know, um, had uh, emergency readmission. Okay, it, uh, after the procedure, so uh, compared to um, only what six percent in, in in the air two trial. Right? So meaning that uh, in this real life studies, perhaps they were offering bronchial tomoplasty in the more severe uh, as, asthmatic. Okay. And three year follow up, um, comparing the air two trial, okay, and uh, PS two, meaning uh, which stand for post approval study uh, trial. So uh, you can see that. 
a similar improvement in CV exacerbation and ER visit in the two uh, studies then. And in terms of safety also, there is no significant reduction in lung function after bronchitomoplasty. And we, I think this is the longest uh, follow-up, the evidence to show that um, um, the, um, uh, the effect after bronchitomoplasty is sustained uh, up to 10 years. And I really don't think, uh, I'm not aware of any, uh, any drug that has been, been followed up for 10 years. Eh? Okay, uh, but in, uh, for bronchitomoplasty, because it is a procedure inside the airways, uh, okay, um, people, people are obviously so worried about uh, the long-term uh, effects of bronchitomoplasty. And it has been shown here that, you know, the, the effect is sustained eh, um, for at least 10 years. Okay. Again, uh, similar result found in the bronchitomoplasty global registry. In involving many countries okay. um, before, um, before, uh, before treatment, before bronchotomoplasty, and first uh, one year after, and uh, second year after bronchotomoplasty, all showing uh, improvement. So then you might ask, uh, what's the Malaysian experience in bronchotomoplasty? We started um, uh, the procedure in Sudan. First center, I think, is. Uh, is still uh, the only center in Malaysia. We started uh, the, uh, the, the service in June 2012, uh, about what, 10 years ago. And uh, initially we, we, we had uh, only a few uh, patients who so presented our, our uh, experience as a case series uh, at World Congress for Bronchology um, in 2014. Then in the, um, 2019, uh, we had more data, and um, we uh, presented our uh, presented our data at Chess World Congress uh, in Bangkok. And we uh, something that we noticed was that um, we could get good response um, uh, despite delivering lower activations. And then finally, we uh, we got uh, our paper published in Singapore Medical Journal, which you can easily uh, access. So what about BT in allergy asthma? Uh, I, always get, uh, I always get this question. Um, well, there is evidence that uh, BT works uh, in allergy asthma. As you can, if you remember in the ad, in the ADO trial there, uh, they even, they also included a patient with allergy asthma. And um, um, I think you can appreciate that, you know, uh, there is um, down here in table two there, you can see before BT, um, percentage of, um, um, of um, omalizumab used, 46%, excuse me. And uh, one year after BT, uh, there is a significant reduction in, um, in, um, in, in the use of omalizumab there, eh? key value less than 0.05. Statistically significant. So, I hope I have answered these questions. Uh, does it work uh, in allergy asthma? Certainly, it works. All right. So this is in the uh, uh, not so busy algorithm showing um, the where is the role of bronchitomoplasty uh, in the management of severe asthma. So we all know at this stage, you know. Um, you have uh, type 2 inflammation, uh, non-type 2 inflammation, and if it is type 2 inflammation, now you, you, you have options and, uh, you know, um, all kind of biologics. I'm not going into that. And then, um, the, you know, uh, the, the asthmatics, um, we, uh, we fall into the non-type 2 inflammation, the treatment, you, you, bronchotomoplasty can be considered. Okay, and even uh, in the type two group, okay, um, um, you know, if the patient doesn't respond uh, to um, uh, to biologics, I don't believe that everybody will respond to um, to biologics. Okay, um, uh, you know, and if the patient uh, you know uh, prefers to to try an alternative treatment, then you could still offer bronchiotomoplasty even in the type two group. So uh, the last few slides, who is then a good candidate uh, for BT then? So uh, you can uh, uh, 
um, there are a lot of um, uh, societies um, um, making statements on bronchial thermoplasty, like CHES, American College of Chess Physician, um, uh, very supportive of bronchial thermoplasty, and GINA, um, uh, with some caveat there, uh, patients with uh, FEV1 less than 60% were excluded in the pivotal uh, trial. I, I think that this has become uh, uh, obsolete, I think, yeah, because uh, um, there there are studies uh, being performed uh, on uh, you know on, on patients uh, with uh, FV1 less than uh, fifty percent. Uh, so in, in those patients, uh, in those asthmatics uh, with uh, with poor lung function, uh, bronchial bronchial thermoplasty uh, work. And uh, I think in the latest uh, GINA guideline, that is mentioned uh, the role of uh, BP. Okay. So the current guidelines, ATS, ERS 2014, uh, still uh, a bit uh, uh, pessimistic then. Um, okay. Um, uh, suggesting that uh, recommending uh, BP to be offered in the context of uh, registry. And our local Malaysian guideline there. Um, Prof. Andrea or the chair here. Okay, so uh, B uh, is stated here. BT is a treatment option in severe persistent asthma. The use of the modality is to be decided by the pulmonologist. Okay. An ideal patient to me would be a pr uh, you know frequent exacerbator despite maximal bronchodilator and ICS and not a candidate or non-responsive uh, to biologics. The type too low severe asthma. Okay, back to our patient. So what do we do? Well, um, we offer bronchothermoplasty, and as you can see here, um, um, uh, happy ending for her. You know, and she's still very well. Nine years post bronchothermoplasty. Okay, my last slide. I think final food for thought. So BT is associated with improvement in a in AQLQ. Exacerbation rates and ER visit. BP is, is an alternative therapy for patients with severe asthma that is inadequately controlled with medical therapy. There is histological evidence that BT reduces smooth muscle mass, and real life studies and registries uh, support the result from the initial trial. And BT appears to be safe with sustained effect for at least 10 years, but with the risk of post-procedure exacerbation. Okay, so uh, to begin with, uh, this is a 36 years old lady a radiographer in Hospital Slayang with known case of bronchial asthma. She had a frequent exacerbation multiple hospital admissions per year with history of ICU admission for NIV. Uh, no history of intubation for this patient. She had multiple drug allergy, uh, including antibiotics. Usually the trigger will be dust and cold weather. He, she has no pets or carpet at home. Uh, other than asthma, she also got uh, psoriasis with uh, psoriatic atropathy, which uh, began in 2010, where uh, metrosexate was started in, uh, when she's not responding to in, uh, when she was not responded to metrosexate, she was changed to biologics. There's three biologics has been uh, used uh, on this patient, uh, starting from June 2018 to January 2021, uh, from IL-17 sikukinumab to gusalkumab and isekuzumab. Uh, other than these uh, two uh, problems, she also got allergy rhinitis currently under ENT where mamutasan spray has been started. Uh, she also is a known case of obesity with GMI is about 30 to 32 and gastroesophageal reflux disease. So let's zoom in, in uh, to the asthma itself. She initially presented to us in 2017 where her ACT score was around 13. 
uh, during this time, the total IgE was 642. Spirometry showed uh, a restrictive disease, where CT thorax no, uh, showed normal lung parenchyma disease. Her medication during that time, she, we already used triple therapy with Spiriva and Foster. Uh, she was started on fluticasone uh, at on, uh, ICS uh, inhalers and on mentolicus and theophylline. 2018, uh, her ACT score still hovering around 11 to 14, where she had multiple admissions uh, to the hospital with multiple uh, infection, lung infection. Uh, during this time, her essential count was 0 0.8. In view of the multiple admission to the hospital, her fluticasone uh, uh, inhalers was stopped. Uh, in 2018 itself, uh, her psoriasis uh, flare came back. So from sequelcunumab, uh, then uh, dermatologist changed to guselcomab, which is IL-23. This is a summary of uh, multiple hospital admission in 2018. We can see there is about one, two, three, four, five admission had occurred during this year alone. 2019, her ACT score Still not much changes, only one episode with uh, ACT score 23. Uh, woke up for severe asthma has been done, nothing much came back as positive, except for in 2020, where it, uh, her ACT came back as 1.09. Uh, in view of the symptom is not well controlled, her fluticasone 2 puff TDS was restarted back. Uh, even with that, he still need, she still needed to use a uh, nap sabutamol at home at least three times a week. In 2020, in 2021, uh, during the pen, during during the uh, COVID-19 uh, era, uh, she only able to visit. Uh, she only only visited hospital. Uh, only visited our clinic for once. Where in November itself, we had uh, another uh, infection and exacerbation. But uh, during this time, her cirrhosis become worsened. So from Guzalcumab, now he, she is on Izakuzumab, which is IL-17A. Uh, during this time, she's, her medication is still the same with Spiriva and Foster as in triple therapies. So uh, 2022, when she, we saw her in January 2022, her ACT score was 12. She needing uh, MBI sabutamol daily with poorly controlled symptoms. Uh, in view of NSZ just came in into the picture, so we started the patient on NSZ. Uh, unfortunately, she unable we unable to control the symptom of asthma with NSZ, hence we changed back to the uh, the previous medication. Uh, her total serum IgE in 2022 came back as uh, 1,026. Uh, during the, during the discussion in the clinic, we decided to give a patient uh, omalizumab. This first uh, omalizumab, omalizumab given on April 2022. Uh, up to now, uh, we gave her two times of uh, two doses of omalizumab, which is on uh, 23rd of March and 7th of April. Uh, but in view of currently, we are, wait, we are still waiting for approval of JPA, her omalizumab was stopped for now, uh, pending for the approval of JPA. As for now, uh, recently, uh, she just uh, got admitted back to the hospital for the exacerbations. We are, have, we've been having trouble in terms of managing her asthma, asthma control, despite uh, all the medications that we've been given. Now it's more towards uh, biology therapies that we left behind. With that, I would like to uh, open the floor for discussion regarding this case. Um. Uh, Dr. Mazuki, um, uh, for this patient, so earlier patient received uh, biologics for um, psoriasis treatment, and now we are considering to give uh, another biologic for asthma. In your experience, um, do you encounter similar patient, and how is it possible to give uh, another biologic for asthma while patient receiving already received? Uh, biology for other medical illness. Dr. Mike. Thanks, Amit. Uh, so far, I don't have any patients uh, with multiple uh, biologics for different education. Uh, so I don't have any experience on, on this. Uh, but I presume um, it depends on priority in terms of disease management. 
that is my 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 personal answer. Uh, <clears throat> what, what is the activity of psoriatic uh, psoriasis disease itself? Is it really really bad that she needs to be on on uh, long term biologics? There's no chance to stop for a while or chance to uh, biologic free for a while uh, because I think uh, even if you look at literature, I don't see any. Um, any combination of different biologics for different uh, disease uh, be reported uh, because we know the side effects, the potential side effects, as well as uh, short term and long term. No one knows what's, what is going to happen to patient. So my approach will be uh, looking, looking back at the disease specific. If psoriasis is under control, probably we give some, some time to uh, uh, biologic free for psoriasis. And now priorities on asthma management, asthma control. Then uh, if there's indication, I think there's real indication for biologic in this uh, severe, um, severe allergic, uh, severe allergic, usually asthma, then you consider the best bi biologics which is available. I, I'm a bit worried to give both uh, biologics at one time without knowing what will be the benefits and the bad things that might happen to patient. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the other uh, problem with her because of the psoriasis, uh, every time that you have severe asthma patient that require systemic steroid, we have to temper the steroid very slow or else the, the psoriasis will flare up. In fact, for the psoriasis, she's already been on few um, biologics uh, for the psoriasis for a few years back. And now, now so the question, should we, should we add another biologic? Uh, for asthma, because the, this is new new field that nobody have experienced or ventured before, lah, as Dr. Mat uh, explained to it just now. Um, uh, the next question is for Prof. Andrea. Um, how do we treat um, those who have um, T2 severe asthma with overlap allergic and endophilic uh, phenotype? Oh, okay, uh, difficult question. I think uh, if, uh, so the main thing would be there's ongoing inflammation. I probably think that the most sensible thing would be to target that first. So treatment-wise would be, as I mentioned in my lecture, majority of patients, the, we, I would start um, with the basics first. Uh, I would actually look at the diagnosis and probably explore to see whether um, some documentation of the fact that the patient's got a reversible airway and the patient is indeed eosinophilic. And then I would um, probably look at the comorbidities to see whether there is anything that it's actually uh, can be treated. So for example, I think it's a one airway thing from the nose all the way down and it branches to the trachea and to the esophagus. So we've been caught a few times before with patients with um, uh, the nose being the predominant problem or the reflux esophagitis being the predominant problem. Sometimes it's difficult to uh, differentiate between uh, which one is the predominant problem so we treat concurrently. Um, the other thing would be actually in terms of the inhaler technique. Um, and I think it is always worth looking at the patient doing the inhaler. Um, and uh, correcting it as you go along uh, and there is this uh, equipment called the in-check dial where you can actually assess to see which because there are many inhalers in the technique in the it, sorry there are many inhalers in the market and each of them have got a different uh, internal resistance meaning that the patient's effort for each individual inhaler is different so it's basically like matching the inhaler to the inspiratory effort of the patient yeah. And then, of course, you go up following the GINA guidelines and you actually taper up, meaning that um, once the patient's maximize on uh, high-dose uh, inhaled corticosteroids, you probably want to think about adding another additional reliever therapy, which would be LAMA. Uh, and you probably want to give a, if at that point the patient is still symptomatic, you might consider a short course of oral corticosteroids. Throughout the whole entire process, it's always... Um, very boring but very important to again check the inhaler and the adherence. I think the best thing would be ideally in an ideal world we would have an inhaler with a counter, dose counter. Otherwise, um, you, it's a bit difficult to actually say for sure that the patient is actually compliant to treatment. So long roundabout answer but uh, this is probably what I would do. Yeah, but so Dr. Mart, we welcome uh, comments from you as well. How about Dr. Mart, overlap? 
overlap uh, uh, eosinophilic and uh, allergic asthma? How we treat them? Thanks, uh, I mean, and uh, Prof. Andrea, I think you, 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 Prof. Andrea mentioned about the um, step-by-step -step approach to managing patients with uh, severe allergic uh, eosinophilic asthma from the beginning, but I think uh, once we have done that, everything, comorbidities has been uh, taken care of, I mean, the compliance has no issue, and uh, we decide the patient needs a uh, biologic, for example, so how do you decide which biologics for this uh, severe allergy and usually asthma. I think in my, in my lecture, I've, I mentioned a few, uh, few um, in post hoc analysis on uh, um, what is the best, uh, what, what are the options available for this group of patients? Because you know, severe allergy asthma by itself, for many years experience, omalizumab works very well. But any patient with severe allergy as well as having eosinophilic component on that, so whether uh, which one works better, there's no study so far, face to head-to-head uh, -head trial comparing these uh, agents. But I think uh, looking at the uh, analysis in various trial on various drugs, it works. The drugs that targeting eosinophilia works. Even if you talk about IL-4 and uh, IL-13, which is dofilumide, works probably uh, in a bigger role targeting the allergic component as well as eosinophilic component. So that will be the uh, bigger picture of how the approach will be. The next one will be, of course, availability and the cost uh, at the current moment. So we, with, if the drugs available, then uh, I will go uh, for, for um, I think the better drugs it works well in both directions. So probably a dupilumab is, is, uh, works better in this scenario if you have dupilumab. I think we have now in the market and uh, as compared to just giving a uh, trial, trying the uh, omalizumab, uh, which might work in set, uh, certain duration, but probably it won't work, uh, it won't last long, in, uh, last long in terms of the benefits. I would consider dupilumab as one of the options targeting both two. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zafran, uh, Dr. Mat and Prof. Andia. Okay, we move on to uh, case two. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, to begin with, uh, this is a 36 years old lady a radiographer in Hospital Slayang with known case of bronchial asthma. She had a frequent exacerbation multiple hospital admissions per year with history of ICU admission for NIV. Uh, no history of intubation for this patient. She had multiple drug allergy, uh, including antibiotics. Usually the trigger will be dust and cold weather. He, she has no pets or carpet at home. Uh, other than asthma, she also got uh, psoriasis with uh, psoriatic atropathy, which uh, began in 2010, where uh, metrotrexate was started in, uh, when she's not responding to in, uh, when she was not responded to metrotrexate, she was changed to biologics. There's three biologics has been uh, used uh, on this patient uh, starting from June 2018 to January 2021 uh, from IL-17 sikukinumab to and isekuzumab. Uh, other than these uh, two uh, problems, she also got algae rhinitis currently under ENT where mamutasan spray has been started. Uh, she also is a known case of obesity with GMI is about 30 to 32 and gastroesophageal reflux disease. So let's zoom in, in uh, to the asthma itself. She initially presented to us in 2017 where her ACT score was around 13. Uh, during this time, her total IgE was 642. Spirometry showed uh, a restrictive disease, where CT thorax no, uh, showed normal lung parenchyma disease. Her medication during that time, she, we already used triple therapy with Spiriva and Foster. Uh, she was started on fluticasone uh, at on, uh, ICS uh, inhalers and on mentolicus and theophylline. 2018, uh, her ACT score is still hovering around 11 to 14, where she had multiple admissions uh, to the hospital with multiple uh, infection, lung infection. Uh, during this time, her isenifil count was 0 0.8. In view of the multiple admission to the hospital, her fluticasone uh, uh, inhalers was stopped. Uh, in 2018 itself, uh, her psoriasis uh, Flare came back. So from sikukinumab, he uh, then uh, dermatologist changed to guselcomat, which is IL twenty three. This is a summary of uh, multiple hospital admission in two thousand eighteen. We can see there is about one, two, three, four, five 
admission had occurred during this year alone. 2019, her ACT score still not much changes, only one episode with uh, ACT score 23. Uh, workout for severe asthma has been done, nothing much came back as positive, except for in 2020, where it, uh, her insulin count came back as 1.09. Uh, in view of the symptom is not well controlled, her fluctuation to puff TDS was restarted back. Uh, even with that, he still need, she still needed to use a uh, nap sabutamol at home at least three times a week. In 2020, in 2021, uh, during the pen, during during the uh, COVID-19 uh, era. Uh, she only able to visit. Uh, she only only visited hospital. Uh, only visited our clinic for once. Where in November itself, we had uh, another uh, infection and exacerbation. But uh, during this time, her cirrhosis become worsened. So from Guzalcumab, now he she is on Izakuzumab, which is IL seventeen A. During this time, she's, her medication is still the same with Spiriva and Foster as in triple therapies. So uh, 2022, when she, we saw her in January 2022, her ACT score was 12. She needing uh, MDI sabutamol daily with poorly controlled symptoms. Uh, in view of NSA just came in into the picture, so we started the patient on NSA. Uh, unfortunately, she unable we unable to control the symptom of asthma with NSA, hence we changed back to the uh, the previous medication. Uh, her total serum IgE in 2022 came back as uh, 1,026. Uh, during the during the discussion in the clinic, we decided to give a patient uh, omalizumab. The first uh, omalizumab, omalizumab given on April 2022. Uh, up to now, uh, we gave her two times of uh, two doses of omalizumab, which is on uh, 23rd of March and 7th of April. Uh, but in view of currently we are, we are still waiting for approval of JPA, her omalizumab was stopped for now, uh, pending for the approval of JPA. As for now, uh, recently uh, she just uh, got admitted back to the hospital for the exacerbations. We are have, we've been having trouble in terms of managing her asthma asthma control, despite uh, all the medications that we've been given. Now it's more towards uh, biology therapies that we left behind. With that, I would like to uh, open the floor for discussion regarding this case. Um. Uh, Dr. Mazuki, um, uh, for this patient, so earlier patient received uh, biologics for um, psoriasis treatment, and now we are considering to give uh, another biologic for asthma. In your experience, um, do you encounter similar patient, and how is it possible to give uh, another biologic for asthma while patient receiving already received? Uh, biology for other medical illness. Dr. Mike. Thanks, Amin. Uh, uh, so far, I don't have any patients uh, with multiple uh, biologics for different education. Uh, so I don't have any experience on, on this. Uh, but I presume um, it depends on priority in terms of disease management. That is my, my, my personal answer. Uh, <clears throat> What, what is the activity of psoriatic, uh, psoriasis disease itself? Is it really, really bad that she needs to be on, on uh, long-term biologics? There's no chance to stop for a while or chance to uh, biologic free for a while. Uh, because I think uh, even if you look at the literature, I don't see any, um, any combination of different biologics for different uh, disease uh, being reported. Uh, because we know the side effects, the potential side effects, as well as uh, short term and long term, no one knows what's, what is going to happen to patient. So my approach will be uh, looking, looking back at the disease specific. If psoriasis is under control, probably we give some, some time to uh, uh, biologic free for psoriasis. And now priorities on asthma management, asthma control. Then uh, if there's indication, I think there's real indication for biologic in this uh, severe um, 
severe allergic uh, severe allergic eosinophilic asthma then you consider the best bi the biologics which is available I, i'm a bit worried to give both uh, biologics at one time without knowing what would be the benefits and the bad things that might happen to patient yep. thank you uh, i think uh, the other uh, problem with her uh, because of the psoriasis uh, every time that you have severe asthma patient that requires systemic steroid we have to temper the steroid very slow or else the the psoriasis will flare up in fact for the psoriasis she already been on few um, biologics uh, for the psoriasis for a few years back and now now so the question should we should we add another biologic uh, for asthma because the, this is new new field that nobody have experienced or venture before lah, as dr might uh, explain to it just now. Um, uh, the next question is for Pop Andrea. Um, how do we treat um, those who have um, T2 severe asthma with overlap allergic and endophilic uh, phenotype? Okay, hmm. okay. Uh, difficult question. I think uh, if uh, so, the main thing would be there's ongoing inflammation. I probably think that the most sensible thing would be to target that first. So treatment-wise would be, as I mentioned in my lecture, majority of patients, the, we, I would start um, with the basics first. Uh, I would actually look at the diagnosis and probably explore to see whether um, some documentation of the fact that the patient's got a reversible airway and the patient is indeed eosinophilic. And then I would um, probably look at the comorbidities to see whether there is anything that it's actually uh, can be treated. So for example, I think it's a one airway thing from the nose all the way down and it branches to the trachea and to the esophagus. So we caught a few times before with patients with um, um, the nose being the predominant problem or the reflux esophagitis being the predominant problem. Sometimes it's difficult to uh, differentiate between uh, which one is the predominant problem so we we'll treat concurrently. Um, the other thing would be actually in terms of the inhaler technique um, and I think it is always worth looking at the patient doing the inhaler um, and uh, correcting it as you go along uh, and there is this uh, equipment called the in-check dial where you can actually assess to see which because there are many inhalers in the technique in the sorry there are many inhalers in the market and each of them have got a different uh, internal resistance meaning that the patient's effort for each individual inhaler is different so it's basically like matching the inhaler to the inspiratory effort of the patient yeah and then of course you go up following the gina guidelines and you actually taper up meaning that um once the patients maximize on uh, high dose uh, inhaled corticosteroids you probably want to think about adding another additional reliever therapy which will be llama uh, and you probably want to give a if at that point the patient is still symptomatic you might consider a short course of oral corticosteroids throughout the whole entire process it's always um, very boring but very important to again check the inhaler and the adherence I think the best thing would be ideally in an ideal world we would have an inhaler with a counter dose counter otherwise um, you, it's a bit difficult to actually say for sure that the patient is actually compliant to treatment so long roundabout answer but uh, this is probably what I would do yeah but so Dr. Matt we welcome uh, comments from you as well how about Dr. Matt overlap overlap uh, uh, synophilic and uh, allergic asthma, how we treat them? Yeah, thanks, uh, I mean, and uh, Prof. Andrea, I think you, 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 Prof. Andrea mentioned about the step-by-step um, -step approach to managing patients with uh, severe allergic uh, synophilic asthma from the beginning, but I think uh, once we have done that, everything, comorbidities has been uh, taken care of, I mean, the compliance has no issue, and uh, we decide the patient needs a uh, biologic, for example. So how do you decide which biologics for this uh, severe allergy and eosinophilic asthma? I think in my, in my lecture, I've, I mentioned a few, uh, few um, in post hoc analysis on the, um, what is the best, uh, what, what are the options available for this group of patients? Because, you know, severe allergy asthma by itself, for many years experience, omalizumab works very well. But any patient with severe allergy as well as having eosinophilic component on that. So whether uh, 
which one works better? There's no study so far, face to uh, head to head trial comparing these uh, agents. But I think uh, looking at the uh, analysis in various trials on various drugs, it works. The drugs that targeting usually works. Even if you talk about IL4 and uh, IL13, which is rufilumide, works probably uh, in a bigger role targeting the allergic component as well as eosinophilic component. So that will be the uh, bigger picture of how the approach will be. And the next one will be, of course, availability and the cost uh, at the current moment. So we, with, if the drug's available, then uh, I will go uh, for, for um, I think the better drugs it works well in both direction. So probably a dupilumab is, is, uh, works better in this scenario if you have dupilumab. I think we have now in the market and uh, as compared to just giving or uh, try, trying the uh, omalizumab, uh, which might work in set, uh, certain duration, but probably it won't work, uh, it won't last long, in, uh, last long in terms of the benefits. I would consider dupilumab as one of the options targeting both two. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zafran, uh, Dr. Mat, and Prof. Andia. Okay, we move on to uh, case two, uh, uh, case discussion before we uh, 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 get Dr. Jamalul to present uh, his presentation. So can we uh, discuss uh, case number two by Dr. Loh Chanchi? So congratulations, uh, congratulations uh, Dr. Loh. Uh, she recently passed her recipe by exam. Currently, she's working in MMC. The floor is yours, Dr. Loh. Thank you for the um, for congratulating me for my recent um, passing exam. So I think I'll share my screen. Okay, so today I'll be sharing uh, a case on a patient of mine. Uh, she's Madam S, 57 year old Malay lady. She's one of our staff in our hospital. She's a never smoker with a background illness of diabetes mellitus, obesity, having BMI of 36, and osteoarthritis of both knees. So in terms of asthma, she has been diagnosed since early age at the age of uh, 18. Strong family history of asthma. Mother and all her children suffered from asthma as well. She also had allergic rhinitis and also eczema. So the treatment that she received at the moment is fluticasone for motral inhaler, pyotropium, and also a Saba PRN. So when she came to us, she has got very poor symptoms control. She used her Saba daily, sometimes even up to 10 times, very poor exercise tolerance, and now her symptoms occur just without specific triggers. So she has got every, every day she's got daily symptoms, can't sleep at night because of her asthma, using her Saba a lot, and also she has a lot of activity limitation. She also has frequent exacerbation, going down to the ED for, ED for nebulizer very frequently, and even in the ward, she's been getting the nebulizer from her doctors. And then she had her first hospital admission in September 2021. Otherwise, in terms of medication, when we first saw her, her adherence are not very okay. She needs a controller probably about two to three times a week. However, when we assess her techniques, it's all good. Her allergic rhinitis and uh, reflux disease are all well controlled as well. She expressed that she remained very dedicated and uh, very motivated in terms of her job. So no signs of any depression or anxiety going on. So while exploring why her asthma is so difficult to be controlled, we have tried to consider other differential diagnosis. So chest x-ray were clear for her, uh, no signs of any fibrosis or bronchiectasis. We even did a bronchoscopy for her, looking for vocal cord dysfunction, tracheal bronchomalacia, endobronchial lesions, obstruction, and none of those are present. Then we proceed with phenotyping and endotyping for this patient. Her serum eosinophil is significantly raised at 1,390 cells per microliter. Her serum IgE is slightly elevated at 92. Phenol is markedly elevated at 73 parts per billion. When we saw her the second time, her compliance to her controller now is very good. 
So this is the uh, results for her skin break test. And as you can see, she's only allergic to Blomia tropicalis, which also known as house dust mites. So I think this diagram is quite familiar to every one of you here. And uh, as we have known now, the patient is in uh, GINA step five of treatment. She's on high dose ICS, a LAMA, and we have uh, done phenotyping for her as well. So we have categorized her as a patient with severe asthma, and we have, severe, we have also considered starting her on biologics. So at the end of the day, we started her on Benralizumab, and she responded really well, even from the first dose itself. So after the first dose, she does not need any more nebulizer from her ward or from the emergency department. She shows, she's still using her Saba daily, but as you can remember, she was using it more than 10 times a day, and now she only used probably one or twice a day. During the second visit after the second dose, she has reduced her Saba usage to one to two times a week, and she does not have any more daytime or nighttime symptoms, and she has a significant improvement in her exercise tolerance and her activity. So this graph is just to illustrate her improvement in terms of lung function and also her phenol. So when we saw her in August 2021, that's when titropium was added on top of the LABA ICS, she only documented about 67% predicted of FEV1. And in November, her phenol is 73 parts per billion. So, and in March, that's when venerizumab was started. Her FEV1 was documented as 1.84 liters, 75% predicted. And in May, she was uh, on her second dose of venerizumab, and her FEV1 has continued to improve to 2.36 liter. And the phenol has significantly dropped from 73 to 21. And so now, Madam S is a happy lady. So thank you for your attention. And this is my last slide. I uh, welcome any questions from the panel. Uh, for the second case, I would like to ask Dr. Tan Juliang. At the moment, we have um, a lot of options in terms of biologics uh, available to treat severe eosinophilic asthma. Um, based on your experience, uh, how should we choose the most suitable biologics for, for, for patients? Um, I think it's always down to a few factors. Lah. So uh, for me, practically, cost is always a concern. And also practically, uh, how, uh, how many times injection that patient need to get. Uh, I think basically, uh, there's no head-to-head -head comparison among all those uh, biologics there. Whether it's Benralizumab, whether it's Mepolizumab, whether it's Tupilumab. Uh, I would say all the landmark studies show it, it do works for the uh, suitable patients. It's just that whether... Uh, how um how patient react to it? So it's like certain biologics, they might have different indication, different uh more more indications. Just for example, uh for mepolizumab, they are indicated so far for severe severe asthma. Also, the uh FDA also approved for some other indica indi uh, rare indication like your uh Wegener's uh, hypoeosinophilic syndrome. Uh, for dupilumab, they ha they had extended indication for uh chronic renal sinusitis with nasal polyps, with severe atopic eczema, uh, as well as uh, severe allergic asthma. So if the patient has multiple comorbidities and you want to target everything in one go, so it's better to give something with some biologic that with multiple indications, then you can target uh, one biologic targeting multiple disease. So that will be uh, the ideal situation in, my, uh, in, my, in, in what I think. And also, of course, cost. Um, it's always a concern because I think biologic is always expensive. And uh, imagine if patients uh, it, it doesn't have any uh, assistance programs and patients need to uh, pay quite a lot. And I don't think they can take the biologics for long term, actually. So uh, for the moment, I think the only uh, the PAP program for veteranism, it sounds quite uh, affordable. They are giving some something like a free injection, free upfront, that, that will cover the first three months of the biologic and subsequently patient and they pay every two months for two money injection. Whereas I think MEPO, I don't think, I don't, I, I think they haven't launched yet. I'm not sure what is the pricing, but I guess uh, it's still monthly uh, injection or something like that. Uh, Dupilu map unfortunately is two weekly injection. So um, patient need to uh, come 
quite frequently to hospital for injection. They, I don't think they have a self injector yet at the moment. So it's also de uh, depends on the product, depends on the indication, depends on the pricing. Can I ask an okay. additional question, Dr. Tan? Um, okay, okay. What is the common uh, eosinophilia in our local setting that we have to rule out? I think locally, we, we they are actually uh, we're quite endemic with uh, all this worm infestation, uh, particularly in the uh, rural settings. Uh. I think I still remember when I was still working in the uh, health clinics uh, in Pahang, actually. Uh, we do find a lot of patients actually uh, having some worm infestations. <laughs> so uh, even like helminths or even from parasite infestation. So um, these are quite like a common local cause of uh, eosinophilia, actually. Uh, I think um, there, are, there are no exact cutoff of normal eosinophils for Malaysian population at the moment. Lah. But I think anything that is uh, beyond what is recommended, then we consider that it's very high. Uh, if patients from the kampong area or something like that, then probably you, need, you, you can just send some stool for a while and see and just to uh, work out for that. But like other than that, probably I don't think any other commoner cause. Lah. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lo and Dr. Tan. So, uh, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, the organizing committees and uh, Dr. I, uh, Dr. Amin for inviting me to share this interesting case of a patient who underwent bronchotomoplasty. Um, apologies for the technical glitches. Um, I think this presentation, I can't put it in PowerPoint form, but I'll scroll it down, right? So uh, this is Mr. G. He is a 57 years old gentleman who is a non-smoker with a history of childhood asthma, um, which was diagnosed at the age between one to five years old. And then his asthma remained quiet. Subsequently, his symptoms recurred at the age of 43 years old in 1999 and was under HKL follow-up. In 2003, he had a severe asthma attack requiring intubation in PPUKM and subsequently he was under PPUKM follow-up. He has no known past medical history. Subsequently, in February 2014, he had another severe attack, uh, severe asthma attack, sorry, with type 2 respiratory failure requiring intubation in hospital Slim River. He had nebulizer at home and he used it when necessary. He used rescue inhaler twice a day. He had symptoms of shortness of breath on exertion. He could climb stairs, however, he need to pause in between. And he complains of daily chest tightness, but there wasn't any noisy breathing. Initially, for medications, he was on tuberculosis Civicot to pass BD, and he was switched to MDI Foster to pass BD since 2014. And he was also on Singular 10 MG or night and on MDI Baradual to pass TDS. He has got no known allergies. His mother has got asthma, and he's a clerk in a lawyer firm and claims he's not exposed to any dust. On the first visit, he appears to be comfortable and speaking in full sentences. His vitals were normal. Um, the head and neck examination were also normal. Same goes to the cardiovascular system, respiratory symptoms, abdominal, central nervous system, and also musculoskeletal system, uh, system. His ACT score at that point of time was 15 over 25. And the available blood investigation showed that his eosinophil count was 0%. And at that point of time, there was no other um, TH2 biomarker sent. A GRFT, which stands for a general respiratory function test, was performed on 7 of March 2014, which showed that the FEV1 over FVC ratio is 59%, and with FEV1 of 60% at 1.62 litres and FVC at 76% at 2.77 litres, which shows an obstructive picture. The single breath nitrogen washout showed that the distribution of ventilation was uneven. His total lung capacity was 80% and there is uh, no evidence of air trapping, whereas the DLCO was 132% predicted. At that point of time, he was diagnosed with severe airflow limitation. Um, he had uncontrolled asthma and he was a candidate for bronchial thermoplasty. Hence, he was started on MDI Zenhil, which was a combination of uh, Momitasone and Formatorol, 
at two paths PD. Um, he was continued on the MDI Borodul to path PDS and also singular 10 MG on night. A HRCT was um, performed and he was then counseled for BT and he agreed to undergo the procedure. The chest X-ray at that point of time shows hyperinflation of the lungs. A HRCT thorax um, showed minimal apical fibrotic changes and also pleural thickening. There wasn't um, any bronchiectatic or emphysematous changes and there, there wasn't any infective changes as well. He subsequently underwent bronchotromoplasty procedure three weeks apart um, of three sessions. The first procedure was performed on 24th of April 2014 over the right lower lobe with 58 activations. And the second procedure was performed uh, on 15 of May 2014 over the left lower lobe with total of 47 activations. And soon after, another um, PT procedure was performed on 17 of July 2014 over the bilateral upper lobes. So this table um, shows the assessment post bronchial thermoplasty. One month post PT, he appears to be well. He still had nocturnal cough two to three times a week, but there was no longer a dyspnea on exertion. There wasn't any emergency visit or hospitalization. Four months post BT, he had occasional daytime symptoms. There were no uh, nighttime symptoms. He only needed rescue inhaler once a week, and there wasn't any emergency visit or hospitalization. Eight months post PT, he was well. He was able to start exercising on treadmill. Eleven months post PT, um, there was no usage of reliever, and follow up at twelve months post PT, he was doing well on Simbicot one path PT. There wasn't any exacerbation of hospital admission. He only uses Ventolin PRN basis prior to gym. There wasn't any night or daytime symptoms and his symptoms were well controlled after the procedure. So the next table showed the summary of um, spirometry, where as you can see at the uh, first column um, on the initial assessment, his FAV1 was 60% at 1.62 liters. Um, and then one month post third uh, session of PT, his FAV1 was at 50% at 1.28 liters. Um, subsequently, it remained stable at 55% and um, subsequently ranging from 42 to 54%. Even his FBC, uh, during the initial assessment, his, his FBC, FBC was at 76% at 2.77 liters. And subsequently, there is um, no further reduction of the FVC value. And at the lowest uh, column, lowermost column, you can see his ECT score. Um, initially, his ECT score was 15. And um, subsequently, at one month post PT, it has improved to 21. And it improved further. And until the 12 months, Post BT, his ST score was 24. So, subsequently, um, this patient requested to continue follow up in UKM due to logistic reasons. Um, so, the FEV1, so in summary, as you can see, the FEV1 level has uh, just slightly decreased. Um, however, the FVC value did not decrease further, um, which could imply that there is no structural damage due to the bronchothermoplasty procedure. And this also reflects the long-term outcome and safety data, which was outlined in the AIR-2 AIR trial and SORISA trials, um, where there is a significant improvement in asthma symptoms and also quality of life, um, despite minimal, if any, improvements in the pulmonary function test. Um, right, so that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anis, for the case discussion. I think that marked our uh, uh, final uh, session for today. I would like to uh, extend my um, um, uh, thanks to all participants who stay till the end of the webinar, as well to our great speakers, uh, Dr. Prof. Andrea, 
Dr. Tan Juliang, uh, Dr. Mazuki, uh, Prof. Fauzi and Dr. Jamalul as well as our three uh, colleagues who presented for, uh, the case discussion, uh, Dr. Zafran, Dr. Loh and Dr. Anis. And lastly, our sponsor for today, uh, AstraZeneca, Novartis and uh, Boston Scientific. Uh, with that, uh, I end uh, this webinar session today. Thank you.